Falling in Love. Copyright 2015 by Samantha Price. All rights reserved. Chapter 1. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Psalm chapter 37 verse 5. Look Hazel, there he is at the back of the store. Hazel looked to see that her sister was pointing. She quickly pushed Moira's hand down and then looked around the street to see if anyone was watching them. Stop. I don't want people to see us talking about him, Hazel whispered. No one can hear us, Moira snapped back. All the same, don't talk about him until we get home. Hazel regretted telling her sister about her attraction to Stephen Williams. She told her sister everything, so it would have been strange to keep a secret from her. I wish you knew how to speak quietly. Hazel knew the more she told Moira to keep her voice down, the more she would protest that no one could hear them. It was useless. Next time, Hazel would make sure that Moira stayed at home. You wait here with the wagon and I'll go in and get the things, we don't need much. No Hazel, I want to come too. Moira grabbed Hazel's arm. Hazel gently pulled her arm away from Moira's grasp. There's no point to us both going in, is there? Hazel tried to keep her voice calm and polite, but on the inside she was fuming with Moira. I don't want to be stuck out here all the time. Why should I have to wait with the wagon? Why do you always get to do the exciting things? Going into the store is hardly exciting. Besides, don't you want me to have a chance to talk to Stephen alone? Why can't I come in and hear what he says to you and what you say to him? I want to see how he looks at you and how you look at him. Hazel took her firm older sister tone and insisted, No, you stay here with the wagon. Not another word about it. Hazel fixed her mouth firmly and stared at her younger sister. Moira pouted and stepped back toward the wagon. Now stay there until I get back. Do you hear me? Moira's gaze dropped to the ground as she nodded. Hazel set off quickly to the store, before Moira could find any other reason to go with her. She stepped through the door of the store and took a look around, hoping Stephen would be working today and not his mother. She could not see anyone anywhere, and then she heard a voice from the back of the small store. Hello. Hazel looked toward the voice and then saw Stephen as he stepped out from behind an aisle. What can I help you with today? he asked when Hazel had failed to respond with a greeting of her own. Have you come to see me or get things from the store? He grinned at her. She swallowed hard as she looked up at him. He was the perfect height, she considered, as she would be able to rest her head comfortably on his shoulder. Mom sent me with a list of things. Her list was clutched in her hand. Still smiling, Stephen strode toward her and plucked the list from her hands. His eyes ran down the list. This is more than you usually get. He looked down into her eyes, waiting for an explanation. Had he been just any other storekeeper, she would not owe him an explanation, but they had become friendly in the past months. These are for Miriam as well. Miriam can't get out and about now because of the baby coming soon. Mom is helping her out. Very well, but I could have taken these things out to Miriam. It would have been no trouble for me. Hazel smiled knowing how kind and thoughtful he was. She wanted the man she would marry to be kind and generous too. It seemed to Hazel that Stephen was everything that she wanted in a man. He belonged to her Amish community which was a must, he was hardworking, handsome, and now he had showed he was thoughtful. Hazel, I have something to ask you and I'll have to be quick before anybody comes into the store. I've been meaning to ask you on a buggy ride. Would you go on one with me one day? Hazel's hands flew nervously to the strings of her prayer cap. This was the first time any boy had asked her to be alone with him. Up until this point she'd only admired Stephen from afar. He was different from the other men in the community. He was handsome tall and had tan skin and fair hair. He stood there now, waiting for her reply to his unexpected question. The correct response is yes, he said softly. When Hazel opened her mouth to speak, Stephen's mother bustled into the store. Hazel turned quickly to look at Mrs. Williams, and to Hazel's annoyance she saw that Moira was right on Mrs. Williams' heels. Hazel caught Moira's gaze and narrowed her eyes at her, and fixed her mouth in a position to show Moira just how annoyed she was. Why couldn't Moira have done what she was asked just for once? Hazel turned back to face Stephen and he leaned over to her and whispered, I will talk to you later. He put a light hand on her shoulder and went to speak to his mother. 
You're taking so long that's why I came in, Moira said before Hazel had a chance to reprimand her. Hazel drew a deep breath. If she said anything to Moira now, it would create a scene in Stephen's store. She would wait until they were alone, and then she would give Moira a piece of her mind. You go and collect the sugar and the coffee, I'll get the beans and rice. Stephen came back towards Hazel. Need any help with anything, girls? He asked the question as if they were just any other customers, and not as though he'd just asked Hazel out. We're fine. Hello, Mrs. Williams, Hazel called over to Stephen's mother. Mrs. Williams looked up. Hello, Hazel and Moira. I didn't see that it was you two girls, she muttered, and then looked back at the paperwork she had been shuffling. Once their items were tallied up, Stephen helped them put their goods in the back of the wagon. I'll see you two girls around then. Goodbye, Moira said as she climbed into the driver's seat and took up the reins. Stephen gave Hazel an extra big smile and touched the side of her arm. She smiled back at him before she climbed up into the wagon. He waited for them to go, but Moira just sat there looking straight ahead. Realizing that Moira wasn't moving, and that she was still sitting there smiling awkwardly at Stephen, she dug her sister in the ribs. Come on, let's go, she said out of the side of her mouth. Moira clicked the horse forward and slapped the reins against the horse's back, signaling for them to move forward. Stephen stood and waved at them. When they had gone a few yards, Hazel whispered, My, that was awkward. What were you waiting for? Why didn't you move ahead? Hazel swiveled around, hoping that they were far enough away so Stephen would not hear them talking. Luckily, he had just walked back into the store. Moira answered, Well, I thought you'd want me to wait for him to ask you on a buggy ride or something. Isn't that what you want? That was a perfect time to ask you. What? In front of you. Do you think that he'd ask me out on a date in front of my little sister? I'd find out anyway. You tell me straight away, Moira said. He wouldn't know that I tell you everything. Maybe something like that would be just between the two of us, until we're ready to tell everyone of our relationship. You mean that he would want to keep you a secret? That doesn't sound good. Stop it. You're making me angry now. It makes sense that a man and woman would be alone when the man is asking the woman out. I don't know why you can't see that. Moira looked over at Hazel. You're turning into a weird person, Hazel. We never argue, and now whenever we talk about Stephen Williams, you get upset with me. You don't want me to be anywhere near you when he's around. And look how you are now. You're talking all cranky with me, and for what? I didn't even do anything wrong. Hazel sighed, and pushed herself back into the supports of the wooden bench of the wagon. You just don't understand because you're too young. When you get older, you'll understand these things. Moira looked straight ahead. I don't think so. Hazel didn't want to be mean to her sister, but why was it so hard for Moira to see that she was being too nosy where Stephen was concerned? She had ruined things by coming into the store just as Stephen had asked Hazel out. Then Moira had made things feel awkward when she didn't drive off straight away. She could not tell Moira that Stephen Williams had asked her on a buggy ride that would be just the two of them. She would keep that her secret. Chapter 2. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. The first time I noticed the two of them was at our wedding. Every time I looked at Hazel, Stephen was right there behind her. Miriam bit her lip and turned her head to look at her husband, Adam. Why do you worry so much? Hazel is smart enough to make her own decisions, and for that matter so is Moira, even though she's much younger," Adam replied as he placed his hat on his head. Stop worrying about Hazel and Moira, they'll be fine. I'm not concerned about Moira, not yet anyway. I'm concerned only about Hazel and the fact that she might like Stephen. You know what Stephen is like, aren't you worried? Adam walked over to his wife. He could have changed after the mistakes he made with you. I learned. Look how horribly I treated you when you first arrived here and I changed. It's not like that, I'm sure. Anyway, Stephen was nice to me to start with. It was only after I thought I knew him that I found out what he was truly like. Adam shrugged his shoulders in a dismissive manner. Miriam realized that Adam would have no way of knowing how charming Stephen could be when he was trying, and how he was able to woo and sweet-talk a girl. 
Miriam had nearly fallen victim to his false charms, and now she considered that her sister Hazel was at risk. Adam wouldn't know the full extent of how Stephen had let her down after encouraging her to break off her first engagement to Adam. All the while, she had thought that she and Stephen would get married once she was free of the obligation to marry Adam. Stephen had kept secret the fact that he was to marry a girl coming out from Germany. Stephen's ways and the fact that he could keep such a secret had highlighted Adam's good points. Miriam thanked God every day that she was happily married to Adam now who had turned out to be her perfect match. Miriam looked out the window of the house that Adam had built for her and placed her hand on her swelling stomach. Their baby was due in a few weeks, and Miriam was growing impatient to hold the infant in her arms. If he were a boy, they had decided to call it James after her oldest brother, and if she were a girl they would call her Anna Mary after their mothers. Adam broke through her daydreams by sitting next to her. He said, you didn't like it when our parents tried to make us marry, and neither did I, so why do you think that your sister will be happy if you step in and tell her Stephen is not right for her? That could strengthen her feelings toward him. Hazel has quite the mind of her own. That is a good thought. We'll have to do something about it without her knowing. Adam gently pushed some dark strands of her hair back under her prayer cap and then frowned at her. Miriam will do no such thing. Miriam pouted. Someone has to stop things before they think of marriage. Adam tilted his head to one side. Have things gone that far between them? Miriam looked out the window again and said, There's no way to know. I wouldn't say that Stephen's a bad man, Adam said. Miriam turned her head back to him. Well, you've never gotten along with him. That's true. Miriam tapped her fingers on her chin. Wouldn't it be better if Hazel married one of your brothers? Adam was silent as he scratched his head. Evans got his eyes on a girl from Reading. How about Jacob? Do you think they'd be a pair? Miriam's brown eyes twinkled. Are you saying that we should try and match them together? Adam laughed. Keep me out of it, that's women's business. He leaned over and kissed her on the forehead. But if you do want to match her up with someone, I dare say that Jacob might have mentioned a thing or two about Hazel. Being surprised by the news, Miriam tried to leap to her feet, but a sharp pain across her tummy left her stranded in the chair. Holding her belly, she asked, Really, is that true? Or are you teasing me? She's an attractive girl and she's a good talker. Why would you be surprised that Jacob might like her? Mind you, I didn't say that he was fond of her. He winked at her. You didn't hear it from me. Adam stroked her shoulder. Miriam, you would have to give this a lot of thought before you go meddling in other people's lives. Miriam pushed out her lips. She was just trying to help, she wouldn't have called it meddling. Old ladies meddle in people's lives and she wasn't an old lady. Tears came to her eyes and fell down her cheeks before she could stop them. How could Adam think so poorly of her? Hey Miriam, what's upset you? You think badly of me. You don't know me at all. Adam reached out and took hold of her hand. I do know you, Miriam. I know that you're sweet and kind. Why do you cry all the time when I say the slightest thing? You know we disagree on many things, that's normal for us. Miriam sniffed. I don't know. It seems as though you're upset every day and you cry at the slightest thing. I have heard it said that an expectant woman is not a calm woman. Miriam looked into Adam's face. I'm not a meddler. She burst into tears. Adam placed his strong arm around her shoulders. Mom said that sometimes expectant women get weepy. Miriam pulled away from him. You've been talking to your mother about me? What did you say? Just that you've been snappy with me and you cry a lot. Miriam pushed her bottom lip out. I don't want you to talk about things like that with your mother. What happens between us should be private. I had to speak to someone, Miriam. I suppose you don't know that you've been a little hard to live with since you've been an expectant mother. You don't know what it's like. I was throwing up all the time, and then when I got over that, I was okay for a little while and now I feel like a fat beetle. I can barely move and when I do move, everything hurts and I get pains. I know that you don't like to look at me now that I look disgusting. Miriam put her hands to her face and sobbed some more. Miriam, you're the most beautiful woman that I have ever seen, and you always will be. She sniffed back her tears and looked into his eyes. 
He continued, I know it can't be easy, but every woman goes through it. Most women do anyway. You could be a little more sensitive toward me, Miriam said, dabbing at her eyes with a white handkerchief. What more could I do to help you? She looked into his kind eyes again. Maybe she had been a little difficult to handle. I don't know. I just want the baby to hurry up and get here so things can go back to normal. Do you want me to stay here with you today? I could do that if you want me to. No, you go and do your work, they need every hand. I'll think on what you said. I'll go now then. Adam stood, leaned down and gently kissed her on her cheek. The Stutzman family and her family, the Shantz family, worked their land together, and they'd always been close. It was the Stutzmans who had left Switzerland first, and after five years her family had joined them. The first few months were hard for Miriam, she'd missed Switzerland, but now nearly two years later and being married to Adam Stutzman she was thankful that her family had made the move. Miriam pushed herself up slightly so she could look out the window to see Adam drive away. Now alone, she pulled a quilt over her legs and reached for the candy she had hidden in the couch beside her. She popped a sweet into her mouth and closed her eyes. For the past weeks Miriam had become tired all the time, the chores were barely done and the house sorely needed cleaning. Miriam was grateful that her mother, or one of her sisters, visited every day to help out. Today, it was to be her mother. She waited to hear the sound of her mother's buggy clip-clopping toward the house. Adam had surprised her before they were married, by putting a claim on the land on which the house now stood. He surprised her further by building such a large house. They both wanted many children, and this house would fit many of them comfortably. Miriam only wanted five children, the same number she had in her family. She had two older brothers and two younger sisters. Five was the perfect number of children as far as she was concerned. It wasn't always easy being the one in the middle. The two younger sisters were close, and her two older brothers were close simply because they were boys. Having a special bond with her mother by being the eldest girl made up for being the middle child. Miriam's mother had always said that she was the sensible one, whereas Hazel was bold and impulsive. Moira was rather annoying, and took to whining to get her own way, yet everyone was certain that she would grow out of that sooner or later. The hard candy that Miriam had just finished had not satisfied her craving for sweets. As soon as her mother arrived, she would have her fetch her some cake from the cold box. Even though Miriam had already had breakfast, she wanted cake. She looked out the window hoping her mother would be there soon, otherwise she'd have to get it for herself. Miriam's thoughts turned to Adam. It would be just like a man to accuse an expectant woman of being cranky and hard to get along with. Miriam wondered how Adam would have handled having a baby growing inside him, considering that he was a terrible patient on the few occasions he'd been ill. She was highly irritated that Adam didn't understand what she was going through, after all, it was entirely his fault that she was in this condition. Chapter 3 Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 3 Hazel hurried to finish feeding the animals, so that she and Moira could get to Mrs. Stutzman's house to help with the quilting. They usually went there straight after their morning chores, but today their mother had them go to the store first. Their two older brothers and their father always went out into the fields after having their breakfast just before daybreak. As Hazel poured the chicken feed into the trough, she wondered what answer she should give Stephen. Even though she liked him very much, she wondered if one of the Stutzman boys, Evan in particular, might be a better match. What would she have to do to have Evan notice her? He treated her the same as everyone else. It was no secret that Evan liked Daisy Fuller, a more uninteresting girl Hazel couldn't imagine. It made perfect sense to Hazel that she marry Evan. After all, he was the second oldest Stutzman boy and Adam, the eldest, had made her sister Miriam a good match. Even though it was Stephen Williams who made her heart pitter-patter, she knew that he could not be trusted with her heart. All the English girls found Stephen interesting, and he didn't exactly ignore their flirtations, not like a good Amish man should. It was well known that the women outside the community found Stephen Williams a good catch. There was talk of how English girls would follow him down the streets, talking to him whenever he left the store. Hazel pushed Stephen Williams out of her mind. There were much better choices for her. Stephen's family had only joined the Amish ten years ago, and he was not born into their culture. 
In her heart, she was sure that meant that he would be easily swayed by a pretty English girl, or might leave the Amish one day. Are you ready yet, Hazel? Hazel looked around to see Moira. Yeah, I'm just finishing up here. I'll be right there. She cleaned out the chicken's water trough, even though she knew they'd dirty it again in two minutes flat. Somehow, they always found a way to put grain in their water. When Hazel finished that, she stepped up into the wagon with Moira. Even though she was two years younger than Hazel, Moira always insisted on driving the buggy. Hazel wanted nothing more than to have what her sister Miriam had, a beautiful home, loving husband and new baby who would be coming very soon. Hazel had just turned 18 and she knew that she should start looking for a man now, she had a few to choose from. There were the Herschel boys, the Stutzman boys, and the Miller boys, they were the closest families in the area and they would be the most convenient choices. She knew that Miriam had liked Stephen Williams, so that was another reason that Stephen was a less attractive choice on her mental list of potential suitors. Something had happened between Miriam and Stephen, but she didn't know what it had been. From the little things that Miriam had said, and how Miriam had acted around him, Hazel knew that something awful must have happened between them. You're very quiet today, Moira said, glancing over at Hazel. Are you still upset with me for interrupting you and Stephen? I was just thinking about Evan. I was hoping that I might see him today. This morning it was all about Stephen, so why are you going on about Evan now? Don't you think that Evan would be a better choice for me? Why? Our families are closer. Stephen's mother is a little distant, she's not very friendly. You can't pick a man by his mother. Moira clicked her tongue. Just choose one man and stick with him. Hazel stared at Moira who whipped her head around to stare back. Moira poked out her tongue, and Hazel pulled a face right back at her. I'm not going to ask your advice on men, so don't try to give me any. You'll understand more about these things when you're older. Now answer my question Moira, do you think that Evan will be there? If we stay there long enough, we'll see him tonight just before we leave, but then we'll be in trouble from mom for being home late. I just need to spend more time with Evan and I don't know quite how to do that. Why don't we have another family dinner, and you sit next to him? That won't work, everyone sits in the same spot, and that means he'll be at the other end of the table. You'll just have to wait, I guess. Wait until he asks you out, Moira said. Maybe he never will. It hasn't happened yet. Yeah, it will. You're so pretty, Hazel, all the boys like you. They do. Hazel studied her sister to see if she was being truthful. What boys? Who are all these boys? Stephen Williams for one. He's always looking at you and trying to talk to you, he's always following you around. Hazel changed the subject. Is there any boy that you like, Moira? Not really, but it's not as if I have to get married or anything right now. I think I've got a couple of years, don't I? Don't I have a few before mom and dad marry me off to someone? Hazel giggled. They aren't going to do that. How come they aren't trying to marry you off like they tried to marry Miriam off? Moira asked. That was different. It was all about the purpose of our coming out here. And Miriam and Adam make perfect sense together. Don't you think so? Yeah, they do. They are lovely together, absolutely perfect. I can't wait until the baby comes. There are no other Bopleys around here. No one in the community has one yet. That'll change soon when all the young people marry. There will be Bopleys everywhere. After a moment of silence Hazel said, You must not tell anybody that I like Evan, okay? No I won't. Then I'd have to explain to them that you also like Stephen, and that would be awkward. Even I don't understand you. Of course, I would never tell anybody anything like that. That's your secret. Thank you Moira. Hazel and Moira had always been close. In their old home in Switzerland they had shared a bedroom, whereas their older sister Miriam had a room to herself. Hazel and Moira were used to spending time together, and once their morning chores were done they mostly spent their days sewing at the Stutzman's house. They had begun by sewing quilts for the needy, and now they were often using the quilts to trade when money was tight and their families needed things. They hurried into the Stutzman's home, eager to begin sewing. Mrs. Stutzman treated them as the daughter she'd never had. Mrs. Stutzman opened the door. Hello girls. 
I always hear you before I see you, she said with a laugh. Good morning, the girls chorused. Mrs. Stutzman stepped back to let the girls through the door. Their daily routinely started with a hot cup of tea, sugar biscuits, and a natter, before they got stuck into the sewing. Today, their sewing session began with cutting out the fabric pieces for a new quilt. Cutting was one of the most important parts of sewing a quilt, because if you didn't get it right, the whole quilt would be ruined. How is your sister? Mrs. Stutzman asked. She's very good. What I mean is, very well. She's just very tired, she spends all day just sitting around eating and waiting for the birth. Mrs. Stutzman laughed. Yeah, I remember what it was like. Just before I had each of the boys, I could hardly get out of the chair by myself. Mr. Stutzman had to pull me out. The girls giggled. Hazel said, it certainly doesn't look very comfortable. I don't know how she walks around with all that weight in the front of her stomach. It's hard sometimes, but as long as she's keeping in good health, that's all we can hope for. Do you want your first grandchild to be a boy or a girl, Mrs. Stutzman? Hazel asked. I'll be happy with either. But I do think it's always nice to have a boy first and then a girl. She might have all boys like you had, Moira said. Boys are all very well and good, and it's a benefit that they can do work on the farm, but if I'd had girls, then I would have someone to chat with. It's nice to have you girls here nearly every day. I've enjoyed your company. Whatever does your mother do when you girls are away from her? Hazel smiled. I think she's glad to have a rest from us. She says she has a lovely time of peace and quiet when everyone is out of the house. Mom always says that Hazel is far too noisy, Moira said with a laugh in her tone. Hazel ignored her sister's jibe, preferring to think of a way she could see more of Evan. When are we going to have one of those family dinners again? We haven't had one for a while, and we used to have one about every two weeks. Yeah, we haven't had those very often since Miriam and Adam got married. I suppose we just got out of the way of them, Mrs. Stutzman said. Why don't we organize one soon before the baby comes? Moira asked. Hazel glanced at Moira, thankful that her sister was helping her out. That sounds like a wonderful idea. What day should we have it? Mrs. Stutzman asked. How about this coming Saturday? Hazel suggested. Okay, and we'll have it here. Your mother might have too much on her mind with caring for Miriam. Yeah. We'll bring some hot dishes and some dessert, Moira said. Now all Hazel had to do was figure out how to change the seating arrangement so she could sit close to Evan. She wondered why the two sets of parents hadn't considered matching them together. They had been determined to match the two eldest children together, so why not the two second eldest? Although Adam and Miriam hadn't gotten together straight away, it did work out in the end. Hazel had to show Evan that she was more interesting than Daisy Fuller, who he was rumored to have his eyes on. Chapter 4 And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 Miriam had nearly dozed off as she waited for her mother. The clip-clopping of a horse's hooves caused her to shake herself awake. She sat up straight and looked out the window. A few moments later, Mrs. Shantz pushed open the door. Miriam! I'm in the living room, Mom. Miriam's mother walked into the room, leaned over and peered into her daughter's face. How are you feeling today? The same as yesterday and the day before that, except I'm getting bigger. Did you get any sleep last night? You look pale and you've got dark circles under your eyes. Miriam moved a little on the couch. It's hard to sleep, I can't get comfortable and then I have to keep waking up every couple of hours to relieve myself. Mrs. Shant sat down in the chair opposite her. Yeah, I remember what it was like. Well, have you had breakfast? Miriam nodded. I've had breakfast. Just stay here and talk to me before you go rushing off to do things. I'll sit here for a while but idle hands aren't a good thing as you know except in your case. Miriam placed her two hands on the sides of her swollen belly. I was just talking to Adam this morning. What about? We were speaking about Hazel, Miriam said. Mrs. Shantz raised her eyebrows. What about Hazel? Nothing serious, you don't need to look so worried, Mom. It's just that Adam and I were thinking about a suitable man for Hazel. Adam seems to think that Jacob is fond of her. 
Adam's brother? Miriam nodded. Mrs. Shantz pressed her lips together and pushed her back into the couch. Is he now? I have been meaning to speak to your father about Hazel. I've just been so busy with doing the work in two households. I'm overloaded with things to think about now that the baby is coming. Mrs. Shantz looked intently at Miriam. What about Evan? He's the next oldest. Adam says that Evan has his eyes on someone already. Has he? I haven't heard about that. No one told me about that. Is he betrothed? All I know is that Adam told me that Evan likes a girl. I don't know how far it's progressed. I'll simply just have to talk to Anna and Michael. I'm sure they'd want their next eldest son to get married and not skip to Evan. What do you mean, Mom? Ask them about what? I'll ask them how far things have progressed with the girl Evan likes, find out who she might be and suggest to them that Evan and Hazel might make a pair. The last thing that Miriam wanted was for her mother to make a fuss by speaking to Mr. and Mrs. Stutzman. What are you going to do that for? Are you going to try to arrange their marriage like you arranged things for Adam and me? That was awful to put so much pressure on us. Did you know that we nearly didn't get married because we felt so much pressure? Yeah, but that was only due to the interference of Stephen Williams. Anyway, everything worked out in the end. You two are very happy now, aren't you? We are, but please don't say anything to Mr. and Mrs. Stutzman. Miriam didn't like to be reminded how she'd once had feelings for Stephen Williams. She had put that whole episode behind her and forgotten about it. It's not good to force people together, and you can't tell anybody what I just told you because Adam said not to say anything to anyone. You shouldn't have said anything to me. What am I supposed to do with the information? We could do something more gentle. Miriam's eyes flicked up toward the ceiling. We could arrange times where the two of them could be alone together. Of course, we'd have to do it so they don't know what we're doing. Then their love will have a chance to blossom. Miriam looked back to her mother to see her eyes light up. Mrs. Shantz laughed. I see, we'll plant the seeds and God can rain down upon them and then their love will bloom. Mrs. Schatz raised her arms in the air and traced a full circle with her fingertips. Something like that, Mom. Miriam giggled. Did you have anything in mind? Mrs. Shantz asked. No, nothing in particular. We'll have to wait for some opportunities to come up. I don't think it's nice to force them. I know because of what I went through, but it would just be nice if they had some alone time. Also, Adam said that Jacob would be the one to match Hazel with and not Evan. I strongly disagree. Why, what's wrong with Jacob? No, no, there's nothing wrong with him. It's just a case of who would be the logical choice. Miriam frowned. Are you thinking because he's the next oldest, he should be the next one to marry? Mrs. Shantz raised her eyebrows. That makes sense, doesn't it? I don't see that it matters that much. Mrs. Shantz frowned. It seems you were thinking that Jacob would be the easier choice just because Evan might have looked at another girl once, maybe twice. Now think on this. If Evan didn't like another girl, which one would you choose for Hazel? Miriam closed her eyes and recalled Hazel's past interactions between the two boys. When she opened her eyes, she said, I guess you're right. Evan is quieter, and Hazel sparks him up a little. Jacob is lively like Hazel, so they're probably too much alike. That's exactly what I see. Mrs. Shant stood up. What are you going to do about it? Miriam asked. I'll give it some thought and see what I can come up with. I'll have to arrange a time where the two of them can be alone. Now can I go and do some work? You can make me a cup of tea and I'd like a large slice of cake. Just as she said those words, Miriam felt her tummy tighten. I think I'm having a pain. A childbirth pain? I don't know. I thought I felt something last night and it happened again just now. That's your body getting ready. If they were real childbirth pains, you'd know it. Miriam pouted. I'm glad you've had some experience of being a midwife. So am I, but I never thought I'd be helping with the birth of my own grandchild. Mrs. Shant smiled and put a soft hand on Miriam's shoulder. Now where's that piece of cake? Miriam giggled. I'm going right now, her mother said as she quickly walked toward the kitchen. Chapter 5 let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. 
that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 Having dinner at the Stutzman's house the next night meant that Hazel had to make another trip to the store. This time she would do her best to leave Moira behind. You're staying at home today, Moira, Hazel insisted. That's not fair. Moira stuck out her bottom jaw as she always did when she didn't like what she heard. Hazel spoke quickly. It is fair. I just want a chance to talk to on my own without you listening into everything I say. Also, you talk too loudly when you think that people can't hear you and they most likely can. Moira's mouth fell open and then she screeched, I do no such thing, Hazel. Goodbye, Moira, I'll be back as soon as I can. You're not being fair. Yeah, I am. You can help mom with the chores while I'm gone. I'm not going to do your chores while you're gone because you've been horrid. You can do them yourself when you get back. Hazel ignored her sister and went to hitch the small buggy to take into town. She did everything as fast as she could through fear that Moira would run out and insist on going with her. At last she had the buggy ready and she was on her way. She trotted the large gray gelding away from the house and heaved a sigh of relief. When she arrived at the store, she was pleased to see Mr. and Mrs. Williams driving away in their wagon. She secured her horse and went into the store, hoping Stephen would be there alone. No sooner had she walked through the door than Stephen was right there in front of her. Hazel, this is a nice surprise. He looked out the door. And you're alone? She nodded and looked around to see if there was anyone else in the store. There wasn't. Moira didn't want to come with me today. I've been thinking a lot about you, Hazel. You have? Hazel tried to suppress her large smile. I have. I think that you and I should do something, just the two of us. Hazel felt her heart beat hard and her breathing rapidly increased. She looked up into the blonde-haired man's eyes. Like what? How about I pick you up in my buggy, and we go for a drive this evening? Even though they had become close, the fact that Stephen was once interested in Miriam still lingered in the back of her mind. She wondered if he were truly interested in her, or if he still secretly mourned the loss of the relationship with her sister. Hazel couldn't think of anything worse than being anyone's second choice. Thank you, Stephen, but I do have to get a lot of cooking done. I have a special dinner coming up. Dinner? Where are you having this dinner? At your place? Hazel knew she had to think fast, as he was angling for an invite to dinner. She didn't want Stephen to come, especially when she was trying to get closer to Evan, not further away from him. It's just a dinner for the two families, Stephen. Stephen looked down at the ground just briefly and said, Ack, I see. Just the Stutzman and the Shantz families? Hazel nodded and felt bad for him, but what was she to do? It would be awkward having Stephen at the same dinner with Evan. She also shouldn't invite someone to someone else's house, they were having it at the Stutzman's house after all. Hazel, just tell me what it is with you. What do you mean, Stephen? Sometimes I get the feeling you like me, and then five minutes later, I get the feeling you don't like me. It's as though you're trying to draw me in and then you're letting me go. It's very confusing for a man. I'm just trying to work some things out, that's all. Like what? I know something happened between you and my sister. Miriam? Yeah. What was that all about? Hazel thought she had the right to know especially since Stephen had admitted to liking her. It's quite a long story. Hazel folded her arms. Well? He ducked his head out the door and looked around. Just making sure we won't be disturbed. Anyway, to make it a quick story, your sister and I liked each other, but when she first came here she was set to marry Adam and she didn't want to. Then why didn't she marry you? He breathed out heavily. Hasn't Miriam told you any of this? Hazel shook her head and remained silent. My parents had set me to marry a woman coming out here from Germany, and that's why I couldn't marry your sister. Elsa. His eyes widened. How did you know her name? I just heard about it at the time. I heard that she didn't come out, but I don't know why she didn't. It seems her family were wealthy and they had heard that my family was wealthy, but apparently not wealthy enough. She must have found out that I wasn't as rich as she'd hoped and she felt it was too much of a risk to come to an unknown country. That's all I could figure, anyway. None of it made sense to me at the time, nor does it now, either. 
Was she coming with her family? She was coming out here by herself, which is another reason I think she changed her mind. Yeah, it would be quite hard for a girl coming to a new country without her parents, knowing no one. I guess it would be for some, but for others, it would probably be a blessing. Hazel laughed. Does that satisfy all your questions, Hazel? No. Why didn't you marry Miriam? What else haven't you said? He gave a low chuckle. By the time I knew that Elsa wasn't coming, I'd already told Miriam that we couldn't be together. I guess she never forgave me for hurting her like I did. You could hardly help that if that's what your parents had arranged. Yeah, that's what I tried to tell her. You see, Hazel, we are very alike. The point is, I could have and probably should have said no to my parents. If they tried that now, today, I would say no and tell them that I wanted to marry someone else. They stared into each other's eyes, and Hazel felt her insides glowing as she smiled up into his handsome face. A man coming into the store interrupted them. Don't go anywhere, he whispered. I'll be right back as soon as I see to this customer. Hazel gathered the handful of things that she needed and made her way to the counter. The other customer was down the back at the store, and Stephen joined her at the counter. Can't you stay a bit longer, Hazel? Stephen looked at the male customer at the back of the store and then turned back to Hazel and whispered, I'm sure he won't be long. No, I must get back. I need to help Moira and Mom. I'm not going to give up on you, Hazel. Just then, their conversation was interrupted by two English girls coming into the store. Their hasty glances and whispers gave Hazel to know that they were talking about Stephen. Hello, Stephen, said the taller of the two. Good morning, Sophie, Stephen replied. I must go. You're getting busy now, Hazel said. He reached out and gently took hold of her hand. When will I see you again, Hazel? Hazel glanced across at the two women, who were looking at her in surprise. She pulled her arm away and stammered, I? I don't know. She went to pick up her things, but Stephen took hold of them and said, At least let me take them out to your wagon. I brought the buggy today. When they reached the buggy, Hazel asked, Who were those two girls? Just some girls from town. They come in every couple of days. He looked into her face. I'm not interested in anybody but you, Hazel. I want you to know that. Hazel bit her lip. Thank you for telling me about what happened between you and Miriam, and the whole thing about Elsa. You can always ask me anything, Hazel, anything. Hazel smiled at him, stepped up into the buggy and drove away. She was more confused now. Stephen seemed kind and sweet, so maybe he would be a good choice for her rather than one of the Stutzman boys. Stephen seemed genuinely fond of her. She would only know what he was like by spending more time with him, and that's just what she wanted to do, but how? Her parents didn't approve of him. Not that they'd said anything, but Hazel knew it, nonetheless. It would also be awkward for Miriam if she found out about the two of them. Hazel sighed as the soft morning breeze danced against her face. Why wasn't anything straightforward and easy for her? Chapter 6 God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Numbers chapter 23 verse 19 Hazel had always gotten along well with Evan, and when she arrived at his house for the dinner nothing had changed. As usual at these dinners between the two families, the women went into the kitchen and fussed about, while the men laughed and talked in the living room, waiting to be called to the dinner table. As Hazel set the table, she looked over into the living room. She was sure she felt Evan looking at her, but when she looked up he looked away. Mr. Stutzman tried to shush the boys because they were too loud. Once the boys in the two families got together, they were always noisy, joking around and laughing. Things were very different at the dinner table. Mrs. Stutzman would not allow any nonsense while they ate. There had to be polite and serious conversations while they ate. Therefore, the conversation usually centered on farming and the goings-on in their local Amish community. Just as Hazel put the last fork on the table, she glanced over again to look at Evan. Evan was most likely the quietest of Adam's brothers. Then loud sounds from the kitchen took her attention away from Evan. She hurried back into the kitchen so she would not get into trouble for being lazy and not helping enough. On entering the kitchen, 
Hazel was handed a large bowl of food to put in the center of the table. She walked into the dining room, followed by Mrs. Stutzman and the Shantz women. Once all the food was placed in the center of the table, Mrs. Stutzman called everyone over. As usual, they all sat in the regular seats, as Hazel and Myra had been unable to come up with a plan for everyone to sit in different positions without making it obvious that Hazel was trying to sit next to Evan. Suddenly Adam said, why do we sit in the same seats all the time? Let's change things up a little. Everyone looked at him in surprise. Moira, you swap places with your mother and Matthew, you swap places with Hazel. Hazel and Moira jumped up without a hesitation, and now Hazel was sitting between Jacob and Evan. Hazel looked at Mr. Stutzman, who was looking at Adam, as though he was wondering what his eldest son was up to. Adam rubbed his hands together. It's good to change things sometimes so we can talk to people we don't normally talk to over dinner. That's a good idea, Mr. Stutzman said. Now we'll give thanks. When everyone opened their eyes, the plates of food were passed around. Hazel looked at Miriam and wondered if she might have said something to Adam to make him put her between his two brothers. She was certain that Adam would not have thought of something like that by himself, so she knew that it had to have been Miriam's idea. It was either that, or God had whispered in Adam's ear to change the seating positions. Now that she was seated next to Evan, as she had wanted, she wondered what to say. Before she had a chance to speak, her brother Matthew asked Evan a question, which started a conversation between all the young men at the table. She heard one of Evan's brothers tease him about Daisy, which caused him to laugh and shrug. She tried to listen as hard as she could, but with Mrs. Stutzman talking to her across the table, she was only able to hear snippets of what the males were saying. Just as everyone was finishing off their dessert of schnitz pie and whipped cream, there was a knock at the door. Mr. Stutzman rose to answer. Hazel heard Mr. Stutzman say the name Stephen, and that sent her heart racing. She knew that there was only one Stephen it could be. Then Stephen walked with Mr. Stutzman into the dining room. Hazel wasn't happy with Stephen. He had deliberately come, when he knew it was only going to be the two families there. She did not want him to see her sitting between Evan and Jacob. You're going to have some dinner, aren't you, Stephen? Mrs. Stutzman asked. Before he could answer, Mr. Stutzman pulled out a chair. That would be nice, thank you. Stephen sat down. I don't mind if I do. Mrs. Stutzman stood and said, We've just finished dinner, but there's plenty left still. If you've already eaten, you could help us eat this delicious pie that Hazel has made. Yeah, that looks kind of delicious. I wouldn't mind having some pie. Did you make this, Hazel? Stephen asked, staring at her from across the table. Hazel nodded. She was too angry with him to speak. Mrs. Stutzman placed a large slice of pie in front of Stephen. I've come to bring you some fabric, Mrs. Stutzman, Stephen said as he picked up a fork. Mrs. Stutzman sat back down in her chair. You have? Yeah, we overordered fabric for the store, and rather than send it back, I thought that you might be able to use it for your quilting. Stephen smiled widely and looked from Mrs. Stutzman to Hazel. Hazel looked away from him quickly as soon as their eyes met. Stephen, that's very kind of you. Thank your mother very much for me, Mrs. Stutzman said. As Stephen ate his pie, the conversations at the table carried on as usual. When he had finished the last bite, he said, I'm sorry I interrupted, it looks like you're having a family gathering. Not at all, Stephen, you're welcome here all the time, Mr. Stutzman said. We're delighted that you could come and enjoy our evening with us. Mrs. Stutzman nodded in agreement. When everyone was finished eating, the men went into the living room, while the women cleared up and washed the dishes. Miriam tried to join the ladies in the cleanup, but Mrs. Stutzman forced her to sit down. You just talk to us, Miriam. You don't have to do anything in your state. Miriam sat down. Mom says it's better if I walk around and do things. She says that it will make the baby come quicker. Mrs. Stutzman laughed. No, Maryam, enjoy your peace and quiet. I know you think you're too uncomfortable to do much at the moment, but once the baby comes you'll be very tired. You might wish that the baby were still inside, so you didn't have to get up and feed every few hours. No. I don't think so. I'll just be pleased that he's arrived, Miriam said. You think it's going to be a boy, do you? I don't know. I just don't like to say it, and that's too long to say he or she all the time. 
It's easier to just say he, but sometimes I say she, just in case. Mrs. Stutzman whispered, Strange Stephen turning up suddenly like that, don't you think? He's hardly ever come here by himself, he's hardly ever called in here. Although it was very nice of him to bring all that fabric. It will help with our quilting. When the ladies were finished cleaning and about to join the men in the living room, Miriam, still seated, grabbed hold of Hazel's arm as she walked past. Hazel, I think Stephen is fond of you. Did you see him looking at you? Hazel looked around and when she was sure that no one could hear them speak, she said, He did ask me to go somewhere with him, just the two of us. He's very charming and hard to resist, I know that, Miriam said. But he might not be the best choice for you. Hazel opened her mouth to say something, but Miriam put her hand in the air, telling Hazel to stay quiet. I know you don't want me to interfere, and I won't. That's all I wanted to say. You have to make your own choice. What I am saying is to think very hard about it, before you make any rash decisions, or any decisions at all, is what I mean. I know what you're saying, Miriam. I know a lot of girls like him, and he is handsome. Just be smart about it, Hazel. Thank you, I will. I was surprised to see him here. I told him I couldn't go on a buggy ride, because I was having a special dinner. So he knew about this dinner? Hazel nodded her head vigorously and said, Yeah, he did. He was trying to get me to invite him, but I wouldn't. I see I have no need to worry about you then. You figured him out pretty well for yourself, Miriam said. Hazel and Moira wandered into the living room and talked until it was time to go home. Stephen was the first to leave. He graciously thanked the Stutzmans for the meal and then he left as abruptly as he'd come. Hazel was pleased to be sitting near Evan, and she had a chance to speak with him a little. When Hazel and Moira got home that night, their conversation turned as it usually did to boys. Stephen was the topic of their conversation. Hazel, you do know that Miriam thought she was going to marry Stephen at one point, don't you? Hazel nodded. Moira continued, then he dropped Miriam for someone else, but then that woman didn't come to America after all. Hazel said, Stephen told me that the woman, Elsa, came from a wealthy family and she thought that Stephen was very wealthy too, but when she found out that he wasn't as rich as she thought, she refused to come out here. That sounds odd. Something about the whole story is odd. Why would they be so worried about money if they are God's people? Anyway, isn't Stephen and his family wealthy? Yeah, I guess, but the girl's family was wealthier. I think that's why Stephen's parents wanted him to marry that girl. The point is, that girl didn't come out here in the end. That's why Miriam and Adam had a big fight. Well, Miriam is better off with Adam anyway, Moira said. I can't imagine her with anybody other than Adam. He was her best choice, but I suppose you can't help who you fall in love with. I don't know about that, Moira. When I fall in love with someone, I'll let you know. The two girls giggled. Even though Miriam had moved out, leaving a spare room, the two girls preferred to continue sharing a room, just as they always had. Moira, I didn't know you knew so much about Stephen and Miriam. You never said anything about it. I did know it, but then I forgot it, I only just remembered it again. Hazel said, I had heard bits and pieces of the same story. Hazel asked some questions to see what else Moira knew, but didn't find out anything that she didn't already know. Their conversation soon turned to Evan. He hardly said anything to me tonight. We were sitting right next to each other and he spoke to me less than he normally does, Hazel said. He only spoke to me a little at the end, in the living room. There is talk that he likes Daisy, Moira said. You don't believe that, do you? Do you think he likes Daisy? Moira shrugged her shoulders. Chapter 7 But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 It was late in the afternoon the next day, and Hazel ached to see Stephen again. She had forgotten all about wanting to speak to Evan the night before, as thoughts of Stephen had pushed away any thoughts of Evan. She wasn't sure if she wanted to give Stephen a piece of her mind for turning up unexpectedly at the Stutzman's house like that, or whether she just wanted to see him for no reason at all. Hazel had decided that they were running low on flour, and she had to bake a cake. That was her excuse for going to the store again. She made Moira stay home once more and told her parents that she'd be back quickly. 
Hazel's heart beat fast as she traveled to the store, thinking of all the things she would say to Stephen. When she stopped the buggy, she saw Stephen outside the store talking to a girl that she'd seen in the store a few days earlier. He walked toward Hazel when she pulled the buggy up and the girl walked away. Hazel, it's nice to see you again so soon. Stephen Williams, I'm here to tell you what I think of you for going to the Stutzman's last night. Stephen smiled widely. I had some fabric, and I know how you girls do all that sewing. Stephen put his hand out to her and she took it and jumped out of the buggy. I need some flour, Hazel said. Do you really need flour? You just bought some the other day. Did you come to see me? He placed his hands low on his hips and smirked at her. Hazel tilted her chin upward. We've been doing a lot of baking. Well, come on then. He headed back into the store. Hazel followed him, feeling like she was being ordered about. She wanted to be the one who had the upper hand, and therefore to be the one to do the ordering about. As he headed to where the flour was kept, an old man came into the store and went over to wait at the counter. Stephen glanced over at him. Hazel said, you go and see what that gentleman wants and I'll carry on here. Stephen walked toward the counter with a spring in his step. What can I do for you, young man? Stephen asked. The man smiled. My wife sent me here for some flour and rice. How much for a large bag of flour? Stephen barked out the figure. Hazel watched from the back of the store as the old man scratched his beard. I don't have enough for that. How about a smaller bag? Well, I don't know, do you even have enough for that? Stephen snapped at the old man. Hazel stifled a gasp, and her fingertips flew to her mouth at Stephen being so rude. Stephen had seemed happy and jovial, and then he had snapped, becoming angry in the space of two seconds. Hazel kept staring at the two of them. Well, how much is it then? The old man asked in a steady drawl. When Stephen told him how much it was, the figure was only slightly less than the large bag. Hazel was certain that Stephen had told him the wrong figure. The old man tipped his hat back to scratch his head. You're right. I don't have enough for that. Stephen looked the man up and down. I'm busy, old man, and you're taking my time when I could be talking to that young lady. Hazel stepped out of the shadows seeing she was being pointed at, and the two men now looked in her direction. Hello, sir, she said to the old man as she stepped forward. The old man smiled and tipped his hat. Give the man a large bag of flour and add it onto my family account, Hazel said. Stephen straightened up and took a step toward her. I dare say Mr. Shantz would have something to say about that, Hazel. Yes, that's right, he'd say to also give this man a bag of rice. Stephen frowned at her. Hurry, Stephen, I dare say that this gentleman can't wait around all day. That's very kind of you, miss, but I can't accept such a kindness. Hazel walked up to him and put a friendly hand on his shoulder. Nonsense, you can and you shall. The old man shook his head. I can't accept such a thing. It's a gift and nobody can say no to a gift. I won't take no for an answer. Well, I guess we really do need it. Here. He tried to offer Hazel the money he had, but she raised her hands and shook her head. I said it's a gift. Are you new in town? Hazel asked the man while Stephen fetched the rice and the flour. Make it a large bag of rice, Hazel called over her shoulder to Stephen, then turned her attention back to hear the old man's answer. We've been here for over ten years now. My wife's not too well. This winter's hit her hard. We've run low on supplies. I thought we had enough, but we don't. Is it just your wife and yourself? Yes, it is. We have two boys, but they've both headed north. We haven't seen them for some time. Do you know the Stutzmans? the old man asked. Yes, I do. We live right by the Stutzmans, and they're our very good friends. How did you know? You appear to be Amish, so I thought you'd know them. They've been good to us. They brought us a lovely quilt last winter. A huge smile crossed Hazel's face. I sew quilts with Mrs. Stutzman, I might have helped make that very quilt. She held out her hand for him to shake. I'm Hazel Shantz. A pretty name for a pretty girl, he said as he shook her hand. Stephen slapped the two sacks on the counter. Miriam looked at the sacks. Do you have a wagon? she asked the customer. The old man nodded and pointed outside. She said to Stephen, 
It would be nice of you if you took the goods to the wagon for Mr. Um. She turned back to the old man. Mr. Baxter. I'm Colin Baxter. Without saying anything, Stephen took the bags out to the wagon. Hazel watched the old man drive away. She was pleased that she was able to help him. Then her attention was drawn to Stephen, who shook his head at her. Why did you do that? You'll get into terrible trouble with your father for doing that. No, I don't think I will. He often helps people who need it. The man's just a lazy old sluggard who's too lazy to work. You don't know that for sure, Stephen. And he's an old man with a sick wife. Not everyone is wealthy like you and your family. We certainly don't give our money away like you did just now. Stephen shook his head. It's none of your concern what I or my family does. Hazel planted her fists on her hips. Forget that old man. Now where were we up to? Stephen asked. I just need flour and I have it here. She slapped the bag of flour which was sitting on the counter. No, before the old man came in we were talking about me taking you for a ride this evening. No we weren't. Besides I can't. What about tomorrow night then? You can't be busy every night. I'm busy for the next few days, helping Miriam get ready for the baby. How about next week? I don't think we're entirely suited, Stephen. I thought you acted rudely to that old man just now, and that made me very sad. Stephen stepped back as if he'd been hit. Do you know how many people a day come in here like that? If I were to give every one of them a bag of flour and a bag of rice, it wouldn't be long before my family and I became one of them. We'd soon have nothing to eat, too. You could have showed a little kindness, as one of God's people. Yeah, I could have prayed on his small bag of flour and it might have become a larger bag, like when Jesus prayed over the loaves and fishes. Stephen tossed his head back and laughed at his own words. Well, if you'll add the flour to our ledger, I'll get going. Dad is waiting for me at home. All right, but I'll not give up on you, Hazel. You're the only woman for me, and I'll prove that to you. Hazel crossed her arms in front of her and waited for him to take the flower to the buggy. I'll put that on your papers to settle up at the end of the month, and I'll add what you gave to the old man. Yeah, do that. You had better tell your father about what you did just now. I don't want him coming here asking about it, thinking I've made an error. I don't want to be the one to tell him what you did. Hazel nodded. I'll tell him as soon as I get home. Stephen loaded the bag in the buggy and Hazel set off for home. She wondered how angry her father might be at her giving away food like she had. He surely wouldn't mind once she told him that the old man and his wife really needed it. The rest of the journey was passed with Hazel rehearsing exactly what to say to her father. Best she tell him as soon as she got home. Maybe she would let Moira go to the store by herself next time they needed something. The thought of getting out of going to the store caused her a little concern. She did like to be around Stephen, but his actions showed that he was not the man for her. The man she would marry would be kind and giving, and would always be ready to offer a helping hand to those in need. When Hazel got home, there was no chance to speak to her father. She could see some drama unfolding before her eyes. Her father was outside the house, waving her on, telling her to hurry. She could see through the windows of the house that her mother was running around, which was a most unusual sight, because Hazel's mother never ran anywhere. Hazel stopped the buggy. Dad, what's wrong? It's your sister. It seems she's having pain, she might be having the baby. Really? Isn't it too early? Hazel asked. No, it's about the right time, her father replied. Will we go with you? Moira asked her father as she stepped outside. Mrs. Shantz was following close behind. No, you and Hazel stay here. Hazel and Moira watched their father and mother drive away. I hope it's a girl, Moira said. I don't mind if it's a boy or a girl, as long as the birth goes all right. They can be very dangerous, you know, Hazel said, as she put her arm around Moira's shoulder and guided her back into the house. I'm sure everything will go all right. I hope so, Hazel said. How long do births take? Moira asked. Sometimes they can be fast, and sometimes they can be very long, like maybe a day or two. Really that long? It's true. I've heard of someone being in labor for two days. That sounds awful. Hazel said, 
The mothers say that it's worth the pain when they hold their baby in their arms. I guess so. Hazel slumped into the couch. Would you make me a cup of tea, Moira? I'm feeling tired. Okay. Moira made the tea and set a cup in front of Hazel. When she sat, she asked Hazel, Did you see Stephen at the store? Yeah. I saw Stephen at the store and... Don't you think he is very handsome? Moira interrupted. He's handsome but he's mean. Hazel, whatever do you mean? After Hazel relayed the story about the old man and what Stephen had said to him, Moira pressed her lips together so hard that they were pursed. Well, don't you think that's just awful? Hazel asked, wondering why her sister was silent. Moira breathed out heavily. He would be in a hard position working in that store. He must see many people come through that door who don't have much money, or who don't have enough money to pay for things. I'd say his parents wouldn't be happy with him if he were to give away all their food. They do have to live too, you know. Hazel waved her hand in the air. You're too young to understand things. Moira pointed to the tea that was still sitting on the small table in front of Hazel. Thank you, Moira, I'm so tired and I really need this. I don't know how to keep my eyes open. I didn't have any sleep last night. Why not? I was thinking about things. Lots of things were running through my mind. Boys? Not everything is about boys, Moira. That's all you usually think about, isn't it? It is not. I think about a lot of other things, like quilting. And anyway, don't annoy me, I'm too tired to be aggravated by you. Moira went to the kitchen and made herself a cup of tea, and returned to sit in front of Hazel. They sat quietly with their hot tea. Hazel didn't know why her sister couldn't see that Stephen was mean. I wonder if we should go over and see if everything is okay with Miriam, Hazel suggested. No, Dad and Mom told us to stay here. They'll get cranky if we don't do what they've said. I suppose you're right. Chapter 8 Therefore I say unto you when ye pray, what things soever ye desire, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Mark chapter 11 verse 24 Tired of waiting for their parents to return, Hazel and Moira hitched the old wagon and made their way the short distance to Miriam and Adam's house. Their mother met them at the door. The baby is not coming yet. Adam and Mr. Shantz were sitting in the living room. When Mr. Shantz saw them he said, I told you girls to stay at home. We had to know what was happening, Dad, Hazel said. You might as well go up and see her, she's in the bedroom, Mrs. Shantz said. But your father is right, you must do what you're told next time. The girls ran up the stairs and into Miriam's bedroom, followed at a slower pace by their mother. They all sat on Miriam's bed as Mrs. Shantz explained, the last days of pregnancy women often have these pains, they're practice pains. They can happen any time up to a few weeks before the birth. So the other pains, the real pains, will be stronger? Hazel asked. Her mother nodded. Yeah. They'll be a lot stronger. I hope they won't be too bad, Miriam said. Some women have an easier time of it than others. However bad it is, you forget the pain. Yeah, yeah, I know when I'm holding my baby I'll forget all the pain, Miriam said frowning. It's true, Mrs. Shantz insisted. Thank you for coming out, Mom. I wish it was for a different reason, and the baby was coming now. It's all taking too long. Mrs. Shantz replied, it was good to have another chance to see you before you're too busy. Your life will change before you know it. Moira patted Miriam on her shoulder. It will be any day now, don't worry. Miriam pulled her mouth to one side and said, I can tell you that I'm scared. I've never been very good with pain. This is a thing that most women go through. You won't be experiencing anything that millions of women haven't experienced. It's not pleasant but birthing a child is a part of life, Mrs. Shant said. Adam looks very excited, Hazel said. He can be excited because he doesn't have to give birth, Miriam said in an irritated tone. He can't help that, Moira said with a laugh. It just doesn't seem fair, Hazel said. Mrs. Shant said, there's no point complaining about things that cannot be changed. We have to carry on and do what we have to do, with a happy heart and a smile on our faces. Miriam pushed herself up on her pillows. It's hard to have a happy face when I'm so tired, 
I can hardly move and I can hardly get out of bed in the morning. It's hard to feel happy when I feel like a stranded beetle on its back. It's not long now, Mrs. Shant said. Miriam nodded. Do you want to stop here for the evening meal? No, I'll get the girls back home. Do you have something ready to eat for you and Adam? I can fix you something before I go, Mrs. Shant said. I made something earlier, it just needs to heat up in the oven. Their mother stood up. Would you like me to bring you anything else, Miriam? No, I'll get up now and start moving around. I'll heat up the food for Adam so he can join the other men. When everyone was back at home and seated for the evening meal, Hazel thought it would be the best time to break the news to her father about the increased money that would be on the ledger at the store. Her father remained very quiet while she told him what happened, how the old man's wife was sick and he didn't have enough money. She continued the story by saying, and he knows the Stutzmans. He was such a nice man. When she saw that her father needed more convincing, she added, God says we should feed the poor and the needy. Her father looked into her face and said, That's true enough, Hazel, but best you ask me first before you go and do anything like that again. She couldn't tell whether her father was pleased about it or angry about it, but she was relieved that she didn't get into trouble over the incident. Now she would have the satisfaction of telling Stephen that her father wasn't mad at her in the slightest. Moira rapidly changed the subject. I can't believe I'm going to be an aunt. I'm going to be a grandmother, and you're going to be a grandfather. Mrs. Shantz bumped her husband's elbow. Mr. Shantz looked at his wife with a wide grin. Hazel could see just how excited her parents were about being grandparents for the first time. This is the first generation to be born in this new country. God has blessed us in this way. We should be truly thankful for this. When dinner was over, Mr. Shantz went to sit in the living room while the girls cleaned up the kitchen. So Hazel, do you have your eyes on a man? Mrs. Shantz asked. Why do you ask, Mom? I saw your face when Stephen came to Anna's house. I've always overlooked him when I've been thinking of a man for you, but I don't see why he wouldn't make you a good match. That is, if that's who you want. There are a few boys who are nice, but I don't like anyone in particular. Has anybody shown interest in you? Mrs. Shantz asked. Mom, most everybody shows interest in Hazel, Moira interrupted their conversation. Since we moved here I'm sure that every boy likes Hazel. Is that so? Their mother stared at Moira. Yeah, it's true, Moira said most emphatically. Mrs. Shantz turned to Hazel. And which one do you think would suit you best, Hazel? Hazel blew out a deep breath while she scraped the leftover food from the plates. Each has their good points and their bad points. I'd say that would be true enough. Everyone has their good points and bad points, but which man makes your heart pitter-patter? Mrs. Shantz asked. Hazel grew immediately fearful. She didn't want to be forced into a marriage. What would happen if she told her mother that Stephen Williams was the one who sent her heart racing? She couldn't tell her mother the truth, unless she was certain she wouldn't be pushed into a marriage. Which one would you choose, Mom? Hazel asked. Mrs. Shantz laughed. Ack no. You can't ask an old lady something like that. Hazel giggled. I didn't mean which one you'd choose for yourself if you were younger and not married. I meant, which one do you think would be a good choice for me? I would say that the oldest Miller boy is quite nice. What's his name again? Tom, Moira blurted out. I like him so Hazel can't have him. Hazel whipped her head around to stare at Moira. They shared all their secrets, or so Hazel had thought. This was the first time she had heard that Moira liked Tom Miller. Quite ignoring Moira's protests, Mrs. Shantz continued, Yeah, that's right, Tom, he seems a nice young man. Then again, there is Stephen Williams. Even with her back turned to her mother, Hazel could feel her mother's eyes fixed onto her. She wondered what her mother really thought of Stephen, but she was too scared to ask. Something told Hazel that Stephen would be her mother's last choice of a suitable husband for her. Chapter 9 The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love for giving iniquity and transgression. But he will by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children. To the third and the fourth generation. Numbers chapter 14 verse 18 As the Shantz family walked toward the Miller's house for the Sunday gathering, Stephen Williams called Hazel aside. 
What is it, Stephen? She snapped. I thought you'd like to know I've been to Colin's house. I've helped him and his wife with some house repairs, and I took them a considerable amount of food. Hazel felt bad for snapping at him. Stephen, that's wonderful. She remembered how awful he'd been to Colin when he'd come into the store the other day. Now he'd made up for his rudeness. I thought that would make you happy. I realized that I've been a mean and selfish person, you helped me to see that. How are they? Colin and his wife? They're well. Nancy, Colin's wife, is getting better. Come along, Hazel. Hazel turned to see Miriam and Adam right by her. Hello, Miriam, I'll be right there. Stephen smiled at her again when Hazel turned back around to look at him. You go on ahead, I'll tend to my horse, and I'll be in soon. Miriam had waited for her, and Adam had gone ahead into the house. Miriam grabbed Hazel's arm. Words are easy, and he might have been nice to that elderly couple just so he could impress you. All I'm saying to you is to be careful. I don't like him though, Miriam. Not like that. Hazel didn't mean to lie, her lie slipped out of her mouth before she could think of what to say. You've got your eyes on someone else? Miriam asked. Hazel nodded. I don't want to say who in case he doesn't feel the same about me. I've got an idea who it is, Miriam said. Hazel frowned at her sister. Do you? Miriam nodded. Yeah, I think that I do. Hazel whispered, can you keep quiet about it then? I wouldn't want anyone to know. Yeah, I won't say a thing but I could do something to help you. Like what? Hazel giggled. Ask you both to dinner. They stopped talking when they reached the front door of the house. Their small Amish community had built up to a point where they were now able to hold their gatherings every second Sunday, rather than every fourth Sunday. Also, they now had grown enough to have two ministers and a deacon in their district. Bishop John Fair visited once a month, and this Sunday the bishop was in attendance. All the furniture had been moved out of the Miller House to fit in all the long benches for people to sit on. There were close on 80 folk in attendance, and the miller's house was small, so everyone was close together. Hazel noticed that Stephen's mother was glaring at her from one of the rows in the middle. She nodded at Mrs. Williams and smiled, but Mrs. Williams' expression did not change. Mrs. Williams curled her upper lip into a snarl, and she turned around. Hazel had no idea what she had done to cause such a sour face on Stephen's mother. Maybe Stephen had said something about her. Would the fact that she had refused her son's advances be enough to turn Mrs. Williams into a sour puss? Moira slid into the row beside Hazel. What have you done to old Mrs. Williams? Not sure. Hazel shrugged. Did you see the look she just gave me? I sure did. I'm going to go and speak to her and find out why she's mad at me. Hazel half stood up and then Moira pulled her back down. No, don't. Hazel, you can't speak to her. What would you say? Don't stop me, Moira. You wait here and I'll be back in a minute. Hazel slid into the seat beside Mrs. Williams. Hello, Mrs. Williams. I said hello to you from back there, but you mustn't have seen me. I saw you, Mrs. Williams said, still looking straight ahead. Have I done something to upset you, Mrs. Williams? Mrs. Williams swiveled her chubby neck and faced Hazel. You think you're better than us? Then who? I don't think I'm better than anybody. Stephen said that you wouldn't do anything with him that he suggested. Hazel frowned. He's a grown man and he runs and complains to his mother? He's a good boy and he tells me all his concerns, like any good boy would. Boy. When does a boy become a man in your eyes, Mrs. Williams? He must be well over twenty. In fact, I think he'd be about twenty-five years old. At that moment, the bishop walked to the front of the room. The people standing hurried to take their seats. Hazel did not want to get hemmed in and have to sit next to this cranky lady for the entire service. I'll have to get back to Moira. Mrs. Williams did not reply. When Hazel slid to sit next to Moira, Moira asked, what did she say? I'll tell you later, Hazel whispered back. Once everyone was seated, Jeremiah Troyer rose to his feet and led everyone in a hymn in high German. When the singing was finished, the bishop gave a sermon. There were so many scriptures in the Bible that Hazel wondered why she always heard the same ones over and over. 
They did make more sense to her the older she got and the more she heard them. Straight after the service there was always a meal served. Everyone had brought food with them. After the benches were taken out of the house, their food was placed on two long tables down the center of the room. The gatherings always finished with the singing. There were a fair group of teenagers and men in their twenties, but there weren't many young women in their group. Hazel spied her mother standing alone. Hazel had to talk to her, because the lies that had rolled off Hazel's tongue to both her sister and mother about Stephen played on her mind. She told her mother about the old man and about her feelings for Stephen. Her mother told her that if a man can change like that, as Stephen had, it said a lot about his character. Pleased by her mother's words, Hazel looked around for Stephen to tell him she would go on a buggy ride with him, but she found out that he had already gone home. Looks like there's a bad storm headed this way, Hazel's father said to her. We'll have to head home. On the way back to their house, Mrs. Shantz insisted on staying at Miriam's house. Take me back home and I'll collect a few of my things. Do you think the baby is coming soon, Mom? Moira asked. Best I be there when he does. I can't have Adam riding out in the middle of the night to fetch me, leaving Miriam alone in the house. Chapter 10 the Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Nahum chapter 1 verse 3 Hazel and Moira had stayed in the buggy while their father took their mother to Miriam and Adam's house. Their mother had said that things can be unpredictable with a first birth, and she had to be on hand. As they pulled up at Miriam's house, they noticed the sky was very black. I'll hurry and get the girls home, Mary, Mr. Shant said to his wife. Hopefully the boys will have the sense to get back home too. Hazel's two older brothers had traveled to and from the service that day in a separate buggy, and would already be at home. Yeah, you go now, Samuel, Mrs. Shant said to her husband. The girls said goodbye to their mother, and with their father they headed back to their own home. Before they reached home, the wind had developed into strong periodic gusts. Hazel had heard that there were often tornadoes in the area. She'd heard about winds being so strong that they picked up cattle and even houses, tossing them into the air as if they were nothing. She was scared and wouldn't feel safe until she was home. When their home came into view, Hazel could see her two brothers standing outside the house, motioning them to hurry. The brothers ordered the two girls into the house and promptly helped their father unhitch the wagon. The two horses were turned out into the field. I think it's going to be a huge storm like a tornado, Hazel told Moira. Then we better gather everything from outside that could be blown about. Yeah, let's do that. The two girls ran out the back door and brought inside buckets and garden implements, anything that could be easily blown around in the strong winds. They finished and came back inside just as their brothers and father came through the front door. What were you girls doing? asked their oldest brother James just securing everything so nothing would blow away. We could have done that. I told you to stay inside the house. You must do what you are told next time. Yeah, James, Hazel said. When James turned to take off his coat, Moira whispered to Hazel, it's like having two fathers with James around. Hazel smiled at her sister. We're all here and we're all safe. Let's pray it stays that way, Mr. Shant said. Everyone nodded. I'll make us some dinner, shall I? Hazel asked. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Shant said. Sunday dinners were always prepared the day before, so the women in the family would not have to do much work on a Sunday. This was a day of rest and little work was to be done, and that included the cooking. Only the necessary chores were completed, such as the feeding of the animals. Everything else could wait. Before they had finished dinner, the storm had whipped up into a frenzy. The sky had turned black, even though there should have been some light left in the day. The wind was howling and whipping things around so bad that some of them were hitting the house. Under the table, Mr. Shantz ordered everyone. The five of them dove under the table. This is the safest place, I dare say, it's been built out of a solid piece of timber. We'll wait here until the storm passes and pray. They each closed their eyes and said their own prayers, huddling together as the house shook. There was an almighty crash coming from somewhere in the house, and Hazel was certain that the wind would carry the house away. She closed her eyes tightly and wondered if they should never have come to America if this was to be their end. 
Finally, the wind passed and then the rain poured down for what seemed like hours. I hope it's over now, Moira said. Seems the worst of it is over. I think it would be safe for everyone to go to bed, Mr. Shant said. We'll go first thing tomorrow and check on Miriam and Mom, James said. Are you sure it's safe for us to go to bed now? Moira asked. I think we'd all benefit from trying to get a good night's sleep, Mr. Shant said. There's probably going to be a lot of cleaning up to do tomorrow, and we'll all have to do our share, since your mother will still be with your sister. Miriam and Hazel made their way up the stairs to their room. They huddled together, scared and frightened in the same bed. I hope that everyone is safe, Moira said. God will have watched over everyone in the community, Hazel said. I hope Mom and Miriam are okay. They'll be safe, I'm sure. I hope the storm doesn't turn around again and come back on us. Early the next morning, Hazel woke up to see that the rain had gone and the sun was low in the sky. She dug Moira in the ribs. Let's wake up and see if the house is all right. When the girls went downstairs, they saw that their two brothers were outside inspecting the damage that the storm had caused. Hazel stuck her head out the door and asked, Is everything all right? There's some damage to the roof. A tree branch was blown across it. We'll have to fix it before the next lot of rain. Is that all? Moira asked. That's all we've seen so far, Matthew said. I'll make us breakfast before we go and see Mom and Miriam. Sounds good, James said. As Moira and Hazel headed to the kitchen, their father came through the back door. Morning, girls. There's not much damage to the house. I hope everyone else has had as little damage as us. Isn't the roof bad? Moira asked. It's a couple of hours' work, nothing more, Mr. Shant said. We're making breakfast now, Hazel said. Good, then we'll make our way to see how your mom and Miriam are. Just as they were all in the wagon, they saw someone riding toward them on a horse. As he came closer, Hazel saw that it was Stephen. He stopped beside the buggy. He looked fine and very handsome as he sat tall in the saddle. I came out to check that you were all okay. Stephen was speaking to them all, but his eyes were fixed on Hazel. Yeah, Stephen, thank you, we're all fine. We don't have much damage and we're all safe. How about you and your parents? Stephen nodded. We're fine. I was just worried about you all. We're just headed to check on Adam and Miriam. Mrs. Shantz stayed with them last night since the baby is due soon. I won't hold you up then. You're sure you're all okay? Stephen asked once more. Hazel smiled at him and nodded. Do you have any storm damage, Stephen? James asked. Not on first look. I'll go back home and have a better look now. Thank you for thinking of us, Mr. Shant said. I'm glad you're all okay, Stephen said as he moved his tall buckskin horse to one side. As the wagon continued on its way, James called back to Stephen, let us know if you need any help with repairs. Will do, Stephen called back. Hazel looked at Moira and Moira raised her eyebrows. Once they got along the road a little further, their father said, nice man to come and check on us like that. He turned his head and gave Hazel a quick smile, and that caused Hazel's older brothers to shoot her quizzical looks. It meant a lot to Hazel that Stephen would come to check on her, before he had done anything else that morning. Her heart pumped wildly as she realized that Stephen really did care for her, and he didn't appear to mind who knew it. Chapter 11 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness. Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 to 23. As soon as Mr. Shant stopped the wagon at Adam's place, Hazel and Moira jumped down and walked toward the house. Adam opened the door before they reached it. We have a baby, he said, as he stood smiling with his hands on his hips. Moira and Hazel squealed with delight. It's a boy. He's a boy, Adam corrected himself. And his name is James. Hazel's older brother James jumped out of the wagon and yelled, What better name is there? Matthew called out. The next one should be called Matthew. The older brother always gets everything, he grumbled. Adam stepped outside the house before Moira and Hazel bowled him over. Moira was first through the door. She ran up the stairs with Hazel not far behind. They ran into Miriam's bedroom to see her sitting up with the baby in her arms. 
He's asleep, Miriam said, looking up at her two sisters. Are you okay, Miriam? Hazel asked. Yeah, I'm okay. The two girls approached to have a better look at the baby. Moira peered into his face. He's so tiny. Look at him, he's so perfect in every detail, Hazel said. Just then their mother entered the room. He was born in the worst of the storm. Now you girls go downstairs. I'll put James in the crib so Miriam can have some sleep. Can't I hold him? Moira asked. Not now, you can hold him later, Mrs. Shantz said as she took the baby from Miriam. No, I think I'll take him down and show him to your brothers and your father. Mrs. Shantz shooed the two girls out of the room and walked downstairs behind them. How long you going to stay over here, Mom? Are you coming back with us tonight? Hazel asked. I think it would be better if you stayed here, Hazel, and learn what it's like to be a mother. Hazel was delighted at her mother's suggestion. I'd love to. I could stay and help too, Moira said. Their mother said, there's no reason for you both to stay here. You're needed back at the house, Moira. Moira, you still have to help Mrs. Stutzman with the quilting, especially since I'll be here for a few days, Hazel said, not wanting her sister to be too upset. I suppose so, Moira said. When they reached the bottom of the stairs, Hazel saw Adam standing there. Do your parents know that the baby is here? I'll go soon and tell them. I was just about to go when I saw you lot coming. Have you had any damage to your property, Adam? Moira asked. I haven't had a chance to check yet. Your father James and Matthew are having a quick look for me now. All I know is that the house is still standing. What about yourselves? Just a bit of damage to the roof and a little to the chicken house, Moira said. Mr. Shantz poked his head in the door. Well, I'm a grandfather at last. He stepped in and patted Adam on his back. Do you want to hold him? Mrs. Shantz said to her husband just as Matthew and James walked in. Yeah, Mr. Shantz took off his hat and placed it on the side table and took the baby in his arms. James and Matthew informed Adam that his house appeared free of damage. After each of them took a turn holding the baby, the conversation turned again to the storm. James said, I fixed the roof at home temporarily but I'll need to have a better look at it later today. I'll go and visit your parents soon, Adam, to see how they fared in the storm. Can you tell them about the baby? I haven't been out there yet. I'm sure they'll want to come and see him as soon as they can. Sure. I'd appreciate that. I'd like to stay here all day with Miriam and James, Adam said as he rocked the baby who was now in his arms. Would one of you girls like to hold James? Moira jumped to her feet. I'll hold him, since Hazel's going to be staying here for a few days. She took the baby from Adam, and then Adam walked outside with the rest of the men to check the livestock in the fields. Moira sat down and Hazel sat next to her. Look at him, Moira. He's so tiny. He's got tiny eyelashes and a perfect nose. I wish he'd open his eyes, he's been asleep this whole time. Maybe I should see if I can wake him. No, don't do that, Hazel said. He'll wake up when he's good and ready. Yeah, I guess so, when he's hungry. When Adam came back in the door with the other men, the baby scrunched his face and began to cry. I'll take him up to Miriam, Moira said. Did you find any more damage? Hazel asked Adam. There were trees across fences, and most of the crops have been ruined. Hazel didn't ask more, but she could see by the look on her father's face that things weren't good. When her family had moved to the new country, they had the advantage of helping the Stutzmans on their already established farm rather than having to start from scratch. This meant that they didn't have it as hard as many new families had found things, but now most of the crops were ruined. The two families relied on the farming across the three properties, Adam and Miriam's, the Shantz and the Stutzmans. Her family had known hard times, but when they came to America, they had thought that those days of hardship were behind them. This was surely a blow to her father. She could see by the deep lines that were now etched into his forehead that he was concerned about how he would provide for them all thanks to this latest setback. Are you worried, Dad? Hazel whispered, not wanting it to be true. Good times and bad times come and go, Hazel. It's up to us to sow the seed and God gives us the increase as he sees fit. He has always provided for us. That's true, he has, Hazel said, thinking back to the way they had never gone hungry even when they'd thought that they might. I'll fix some coffee for us, she said. 
Moira came down the stairs. I'm sorry, Hazel. I should have thought of that, Moira said on overhearing Hazel. Hazel looked over at her younger sister. No, that's okay, Moira, and I can do it. Moira and Hazel both made coffee, and when they went back out into the living room, Mr. Chance was holding the baby again. Didn't he want to be fed? Hazel asked. He had a quick feed, Adam said. He's not crying, so I'm sure he's had his fill. Let me hold him now, James said as he rose to his feet. Mr. Shant said, sit back down and I'll hand him to you. James sat back down as Adam said, be careful of his neck. They don't have strong necks at this stage. The baby was now asleep, as he was again passed from one person to another. Adam hovered close to the baby, making sure no one put cookie crumbs on him or got their coffee too close. When it came time for everyone to leave, Hazel was left there with Adam and Miriam. Now that everyone had gone, and Hazel was holding the baby, he opened his eyes. Adam, he's opened his eyes. They've all missed it. Adam smiled and looked over Hazel's shoulder. He was waiting for his aunt to be the first one he'd see, apart from his grandmother and his mom and dad, of course. Hello, little one, Hazel said as she cooed to the baby. He began to cry. Oh no, don't cry. I'll take you back to your mom. Here, I'll take him. As Adam took the baby from Hazel, he said, you go and get yourself settled, find a bedroom that you want to stay in. Hazel wandered around the large house. There were six bedrooms in all. It seemed obvious that Adam and Miriam were hoping for many children. Hazel picked one of the downstairs bedrooms and sat on the bed with a bounce. When Hazel saw that Adam had left the house, she went upstairs to speak to Miriam. Hazel poked her head around the door to see Miriam feeding the baby. Come in, Miriam said when she saw her. Sit down and talk to me. How was the birth and everything? It wasn't as bad as I expected, but I must say I didn't even care about the storm. I was in another world, I'm sure. He is absolutely precious, Miriam, Hazel said. Yeah, he's just adorable. I want to take you home with me, Hazel said to him, then turning back to Miriam. I can't believe how tiny he is. He seems quite big to me, Miriam said looking into his face. How does it feel to be a mother? Hazel asked. It feels strange, very strange. I keep looking at him, and it's like it's a miracle. I guess he is a miracle. Do you want some soup? Mom said I should stay here and help you for a few days. That would be nice, thank you. You don't mind, do you? No, I would love to stay and help you look after the baby. I would like a little bit more water, too. Miriam nodded her head toward the empty glass on the side table. Hazel stood up. I'll get you some. Chapter 12 Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved compassionate hearts. Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and If one has a complaint against another. Forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you so you also must forgive. Colossians chapter 3 verses 12 to 13. It took two days for Stephen to find out where Hazel was. He called to Adam's house that afternoon and asked if Hazel would care to go for a ride in his buggy. She had agreed without hesitation. After they'd driven in silence for some time, Stephen stopped the buggy and then helped Hazel out. I'm glad you came with me at last. I've been waiting for this for a long time. I had to be sure that you really liked me, Hazel said, trying her best to be absolutely honest. He had to like her now. He had made it obvious to her family, and now he'd made it obvious to her sister and her brother-in-law by calling on her as he had. He frowned at her. What do you mean? It's just that so many girls like you and you could choose any one of them. He chuckled. I'm sure that's not true. Either way, it doesn't matter. You're the only woman I'm interested in, Hazel. Hazel's throat tightened. No one had ever referred to her as a woman before, let alone a handsome man. She never saw herself as a woman, even though she was nearly 18. Come, let's walk up here a bit further. He grabbed her hand and gently linked her arm through his. I do have to tell you, Hazel, that you are the type of woman I want to marry. Stephen tilted his face up to the sky. Do you think you could marry a man like me? He turned to look at her. His question caught her completely off guard. 
She wondered what she should say as the perfect answer. Of course she wanted to marry him, that's all she'd thought about the past six months. He thought of her as a woman, so she knew her response should be as a woman. I do think I could see myself married to a man such as you. Stephen smiled and revealed his perfect teeth. I'll do my best to make you happy, I'll work hard to provide for you. As far as Hazel was concerned, now that she knew that Stephen was thinking of marriage, the only problem was his mother. He gave a nervous laugh. What are you looking so sad about? I'm thinking about your mother. He furrowed his brow. My mother? Hazel withdrew her arm from his, stopped walking and faced him. I don't know if she likes me. Nonsense, of course she does. No, I don't think so. I don't get along with her, like I get along with some of the other older ladies in the community. He reached forward and took hold of her hand. You wouldn't be marrying my mother, you'd be marrying me. So it shouldn't matter anything about anyone else except us. Hazel looked down at their clasped hands and nodded. Everyone had always told her to think before she spoke. Should she have mentioned his mother at all? She had to be truthful, that was a big thing standing in their way. She did not want to have Stephen's mother as a mother-in-law. She had always hoped to have a nice mother-in-law, such as Mrs. Stutzman, who was like a second mother to her. It would have been perfect if she could have fallen in love with one of the Stutzman boys. There's something I have to tell you, Hazel. She looked up into his eyes. What is it? I have to go away soon to collect another family from the port. How long will you be gone? Weeks and weeks, you know how long it takes. Although I could make better time on the way there just by myself, but I usually go slow so it's easier on the horses, but I could. She thought back to how long it had taken her family when Stephen had taken them from the port to the Stutzman's. No, don't hurry. I wouldn't want the horses to suffer just so I could see you sooner, Hazel said. I didn't think you were fetching families from the port anymore. I wasn't, but I said I'd go this time to give Abe Fisher a rest. He's been taking turns with another man. Abe asked me to do this one for him. I didn't feel as though I should say no. The other thing that I have to tell you is that Elsa Wiley is going to be one of the people I'll be bringing back. Hazel pulled her hand away from his. Ack! Her hand flew to her neck as she fiddled with the strings of her prayer cap. Is that why you're going, because Elsa is coming? She had the impression from speaking with her sister, Miriam, that Stephen had offered false promises to Miriam. Was he also leading Hazel to think that their relationship was more than it was? Was he then going to marry Elsa after all this time had passed? No, believe me, I didn't even know that she was one of the people until I agreed to go. My mother had written to one of Elsa's relatives, and Mom told me that she was going to be on this ship after I had agreed. I knew nothing of it up until then. Hazel wanted to believe him, but she'd heard many negative things about him. Her eyes darted to and fro, trying to piece all the clues together, then she saw him looking intently at her. She stared into his eyes. Hazel, you do believe me, don't you? If not, I won't go. I'll find someone else. It's just that I get paid good money to go on these journeys, money that would mean a lot to us. Yeah, I do. I don't even know Elsa. I didn't even want to marry her. Our parents wanted us to marry. I'm glad someone put an end to it, I'm glad they did. I'm under no obligation at all to marry her or anything of the kind, and neither do I want to. He softly touched Hazel's shoulder. Her face relaxed into a smile as she believed that he was telling the truth. The thing that troubled her was what Elsa would do when she saw how handsome Stephen was. Any girl would find it hard to resist his polite and gentlemanly ways. Although Hazel was smiling, inside she was worried that he might fall in love with Elsa. It was romantic by the fire at night, and they would have days to get to know one another as the wagon weaved its way back to Earl Town. I wish I hadn't said that I would go. I don't like to see you upset by this. Hazel forced a laugh. I will miss not seeing you, that's all. Me too, but I've given my word. Well, there would be nothing worse than getting off a ship and finding out that there is no one there to bring them out this way. That's true enough, I suppose. He looked up at the sky as the rain began to fall in droplets. I should get you back to your sister's house. Chapter 13 For in this hope we were saved. 
Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Romans chapter 8 verse 24 minus 25. When Stephen stopped outside Adam and Miriam's house he turned to her and said, I'm leaving tomorrow Hazel. So soon? Yeah. He put out his hand and she put her hand in his and he held it tightly. I will remember what your hand feels like in mine. I'm sure that I will miss you. You make me a better man, Hazel. She giggled, thinking he was being funny. He continued, I used to be a selfish person and you made me see what I was like. Now I like to help other people, because when I'm helping other people I'm not thinking about myself. The bishop always says the community is one, it's not like we are individual people, we're all one and we all need to help each other. You're a good man, Stephen. Do you think so? Do you really think I'm a good man? Yeah, why are you so surprised by that? He looked down. When that old man came into the store I treated him badly, and you made me see how awful I was. I used to be inconsiderate of the feelings of others. I've always had enough to eat, and my family's always been wealthy compared to others around these parts. I guess I always thought I was better than other people, but I'm not better than a hungry person, or a person with no home. We're all just people passing through this place until we get to our real home with God. Hazel blinked back tears. She could tell that he had changed and that the things he said were sincere, coming from his heart. You've given things a great deal of thought. I have, I really have. I've been reading the Bible a lot, and it's really starting to make sense to me like it never did in the past. The more I read and the more I pray, the more the Bible makes sense. He looked deeply into her eyes and whispered, I'm ready to become a man. I just thought you should know that, Hazel. She smiled at him and he jumped down from the buggy, walked to her side and offered his hand. She took his hand and stepped out of the buggy. Do you want to come inside? No, I have to prepare the wagon for tomorrow. After they said goodbye, Stephen drove away while Hazel rushed into the house. She was surprised to see Evan in the house. Hello, I didn't see your buggy. I rode my horse here. I tied him up out back. Hazel looked around. Where are Adam and Miriam? I've been waiting to see if you want to go to dinner at your parents' house. Everyone is there. Adam and Miriam have gone on ahead. You've no buggy here. Do I go on your horse? You're going to double me, or something? He laughed. No, I was on my way back to get the buggy, and I thought I'd stop off here and tell you that I'd fetch you shortly. Do your parents know that you were out with Stephen? I'm not sure if they do or not. Why? Evan shook his head as he walked toward the door. When he was close to her he said, Do you think that he's suitable for you, Hazel? Hazel looked away from him. He waited for her to respond, and when she didn't he walked past her and continued out the front door. Evan called back over his shoulder, I'll be back in twenty minutes to fetch you. Will that give you enough time? Yeah, I'll be ready and waiting. Hazel walked up the stairs to freshen up. The rain had made her clothes damp. She hung up her dress to dry and changed into another. She knew that it was no coincidence that Evan was here when she arrived. Someone was trying to match her and Evan together, and she thought that person was most likely Miriam. The thought of Stephen spending a great deal of time with Elsa, the woman he nearly married, made Hazel's stomach churn. She wouldn't see him for weeks, and in those weeks he could easily forget all about her. At one time she thought she could like Evan but not now. Even though it made sense for her to marry Evan, she didn't care for him as she cared for Stephen. She wondered what Evan thought of her. He appeared annoyed by the fact that she'd been out with Stephen, so maybe he did have some feelings for her even though it was strongly rumored that he liked Daisy. Evan was back before Hazel had expected him. You must have galloped your horse home, Hazel said as she stepped into his buggy. No, not at all. Well, I went a little fast. He chuckled. Their conversation on the way to the house was pleasant, and Hazel was pleased that not a word about Stephen was said. Hazel had to tell someone what had happened between Stephen and herself, and Hazel figured that the best person to tell was Miriam. When Hazel entered the house, she greeted everyone and was pleased to see that Miriam wasn't there in the living room. Miriam would be in a bedroom with the baby, just the right place for a private chat. She made her way up the stairs to find Miriam, 
pushing the door of Miriam's old bedroom to see that Miriam was in a chair nursing the baby. Did Evan bring you? Miriam asked as she looked across at Hazel. Yeah, he did. You took a long time to get here. Did you two go on a little ride together before you got here? Hazel shook her head. I know what you're trying to do, but it's not Evan I like. Does that mean you like someone else? Stop playing around, Miriam, you must know that I like Stephen. I've just been on a buggy ride with him, and we've talked about him. Hazel sat on the bed which was close to Miriam and continued, He likes me too. He told me about what happened between the two of you, and about the woman called Elsa who was coming out here to marry him. Miriam scrunched up her nose. I'd say that my version of events might be different to his. I don't think he'd lie to me, Miriam. Miriam pressed her lips together. Two people can see things in opposite ways. It doesn't mean that one is lying and the other isn't. Hazel tried to figure out what she meant, but she had not come to talk to Miriam to speak in riddles. I like him and he likes me. I'm just upset because now he'll be gone for weeks. I know, he's going to fetch people from the port. Adam told me, Miriam said. Did Adam also tell you that one of those people is Elsa? Miriam's jaw dropped. No, I didn't know that. After a moment Miriam said, didn't I warn you? No, it's not like that, he said he wanted to marry me. Miriam asked, what did he say exactly? Hazel cleared her throat as she recalled his exact words. He said, well, he asked me if I could marry a man like him. I said yes, and then he spoke as if we'd be married someday. Did he actually ask and say the words, will you marry me? No, not in so many words. He spoke in a more roundabout way. He wanted to be sure that I would marry him, I think. He speaks in words like puzzles. You have to piece together what he means, and he wants you to think that he means a certain thing when he doesn't. When you're certain that he loves you and wants to marry you, he denies his words and leaves you with a broken heart. Is that what he did to you, Miriam? Yeah, he did, but I saw right through his ways. He made me see that I truly loved Adam. Maybe that will happen for you. Hazel pushed out her bottom lip. She wanted Stephen, not someone else. Adam was obviously meant for Miriam, just as Stephen was obviously meant for her. What do you mean, Miriam? Do you think that I will fall in love with Evan? Miriam smiled. I don't know. It would be nice if you married him. I'm upset that Stephen will be gone for weeks. Yeah, and meanwhile, you don't know what his thoughts and feelings are in regard to Elsa. What if he falls in love with her? You need to prepare yourself for that, Hazel. That's what his and her family wanted in the past, so I can't see that they'd be upset about that happening. Hazel nodded and looked down at the floorboards. You know the other bad thing about Elsa coming here? Miriam asked. Hazel looked into Miriam's face. What's that? It's one more woman in the community to compete with. Don't say that, Miriam. People fall in love with who they fall in love with, and one more person coming into the community won't change what God has already willed. James started to cry. Miriam placed him upright and held him against her shoulder. I guess that's true maybe, Miriam said. Thank you for listening. I guess I won't know any more about my future until Stephen gets back from the port. Hazel got off the bed. I'll go and help with dinner. After the impromptu family dinner was over, Hazel had reluctantly agreed to allow Evan to take her back to Adam and Miriam's house. Adam and Miriam would follow later. All the way home, she wasn't listening to Evan's chatter, she was worried that Stephen would like Elsa and want to marry her. Every now and again, Hazel added a comment about what Evan was saying, hoping that she was making sense. When they pulled up at the house, Evan said, Is there anything I can do to change your mind about Stephen? I've heard that you like him. My mind about Stephen is fully made up. I'm not going to change my mind where he's concerned. That's too bad, Evan said. I had hoped that you might go on a buggy ride with me. I hear that Stephen will be gone for some time. It wouldn't hurt to spend some time with me while he's away, would it? Hazel knew that if she spent time with Evan, even in the most innocent way, that Stephen might learn of it when he got back home. She couldn't risk Stephen thinking that her affections lay anywhere other than him. I couldn't, Evan, but thank you. Just so you know, if you don't come with me, I'll ask Daisy and then you'll lose your chance with me. 
Hazel stepped out of the buggy. She stared at him, wondering if she could believe what she had just heard. She never would have guessed that Evan would say such a thing to her, or be so arrogant. Ask Daisy if you wish. Evan jumped out of the buggy and walked around to speak to her. I don't think that you even know me, Hazel. Don't you want a chance with me before you lose me to Daisy? I do know you, Evan. I've known you all my life, and in the last two minutes I've gotten to know you a whole lot better. That's right, and you've only known Stephen for two years if that. We've never spent time alone together. You've known me when we've been in a group. All I'm asking is to have the same chance that you've given Stephen. I want to spend time with you alone. We're alone now. That's hardly the same thing. I want a better time alone with you than just driving you home. I'll give it some thought, Evan. Hazel gave him a little smile. I'd better get into the house, it's getting cold. Yeah, please think on it, Hazel. She smiled at him and walked into the house. She had learned a thing or two from her mother. Instead of saying no, her mother would always say she'd give a thing some thought, and in that way no one got upset. When Hazel got inside, she raced to the window to see Evan drive away in his buggy. Chapter 14 For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. Stephen had been gone for weeks and now it was no secret how Hazel felt about him, her whole family knew for sure and for certain. It was a sunny afternoon, and Hazel was fixing dinner when she looked out the kitchen window to see Stephen's buggy heading towards the house at a fair pace. She threw down the dishcloth that was in her hand and ran outside to meet him. Stephen brought the horse to an abrupt halt and jumped down. Hazel's run slowed to a walk, as she knew that her family might be inside looking out at them. She wanted to run and throw her arms around him, but she knew she couldn't embrace him the way that she wanted. She could tell by the way he was covered in dust, and the way his sandy hair poked up from under his hat, that he must have only just arrived back from his long journey. Hazel, he breathed. I couldn't wait to see you. She looked over her shoulder back at the house, then back to him. Have you just got back? He nodded and looked her up and down with a grin on his face. I guess we're being watched? Most likely, she said with a smile on her face. Hazel, it's so good to see you. I've missed you so much, I thought about you every day. Hazel's heart pounded wildly hearing that he'd been thinking as much about her as she'd been thinking about him. Did you really miss me, she asked. Every single minute of every day. She smiled at him and then remembered her manners. How are Elsa and her family? Elsa came out by herself, her family didn't come out with her. Then you traveled alone, just you and Elsa. Stephen chuckled, took his hat off and wiped his forehead. No. Another family came out here at the same time, the Graber family. Hazel smiled, and was pleased that Elsa had not been of interest to him. Well, come in and have some tea. He stepped toward her and whispered, I don't want tea, I just want to feel you in my arms. We can't not hear. Hazel bit her lip, not knowing what to say. They couldn't embrace where they were, they would have to wait until they could meet in private. I know, I know we can't. I'll come inside and say hello to your family. When they turned toward the house, they saw Mr. Shantz standing in the doorway. Good to see you, Stephen. Are you joining us for dinner? Thank you, Mr. Shantz. Stephen looked down at his clothes. I would if I wasn't so dirty and dusty. I've only just come back from the port. You can wash up out back. We'd be pleased to have you join us. Yeah, do join us, Hazel said. Adam looked down into Hazel's blue eyes and smiled. Very well then. I would love to, thank you. Good to see you, Stephen, Mrs. Shantz called out from the kitchen. Stephen looked up from the well at the back of the house. Hello, Mrs. Shantz. When Stephen walked through the back door of the house, Hazel's older brothers Matthew and James had just gotten back and walked through the front door. The dinner conversation was filled with Stephen telling tales of his last trip. He had a broken wagon wheel, and there was a story of a snake that had somehow gotten into the wagon. You're such a good storyteller, Stephen, Moira said. But they're not stories, they're all true. Stephen laughed. Strange things seem to happen to me all the time. This is the first trip back from the port where so many things have happened to me, though. The snake was the scariest thing. What is the new family like? Mrs. Shantz asked. 
The Grabers? They're a family of two boys and three girls. I'm saying the girls are around 14 to 16 and the boys are nearly 20. Mr. Graber is a blacksmith. Mr. Shantz swallowed a mouthful of chicken and said, We need a good blacksmith around these parts. We need more girls around here, too. Shame they're so young, James said. I hope they'll be at the next gathering, Matthew added. What are these young ladies like exactly? Mr. Shantz leaned across the table. This is not good dinner conversation, Matthew. Matthew lowered his head. Forgive me, Dad. Hazel noticed that the boys all exchanged smirks. They were boys wanting to talk about girls, just as she liked to talk about boys with her sisters. Hazel thought that only a natural thing. Y'all meet them soon enough, Stephen said. They're just like us. Hazel considered it interesting that Stephen said just like us, because she always regarded Stephen as an outsider and not really one of them. Where are they living? Mrs. Shantz asked. They're staying with the Miller family, and then they're going to stay with the bishop until they get a homestead organized. Elsa's going to stay on with the Millers. Hazel felt her mother's eyes on her when Stephen mentioned Elsa. Hazel wanted to ask more about Elsa, but she didn't want Stephen to think that she was jealous. She wondered why Elsa was going to stay with the Miller family. Was she a friend of theirs, or had the bishop arranged that she stay there? No one else seemed to be curious, which was another reason that Hazel kept quiet. Thank you for your hospitality, Mr. and Mrs. Shantz. You're welcome, Mrs. Shantz said. Stephen said, I best be getting home now. My mother doesn't even know I'm back from the port. I put the wagon in the barn, turned the horses out and came straight over here to see Hazel. It was clear now that Stephen didn't want it to be a secret that he was fond of Hazel. She looked across at him to see him smiling at her. Hazel was too embarrassed to look at her family. We won't keep you, Stephen. Mr. Shantz stood up and then Stephen stood up. Thank you for the dinner. I really appreciated the nice meal. Hazel jumped to her feet. I'll walk you out. Hazel hoped to have a private moment with him before he left. No one tried to stop her, not even Moira. Once they were out of the sight of her family, he grabbed her hand, pulled her out the front door and closed it behind them. She giggled, and then he held her in his arms for a moment. She stopped laughing and let her head fall softly onto his hard shoulders before she pulled back. I missed you so much, Hazel. I missed you too. When can I see you again? Soon I'd like it if I could see you again soon. Me too. He moved in closer and pulled her against him and then released her. I will see you again shortly. She smiled at him and then watched him as he leapt into his buggy and then drove away. Hazel walked back into the house, pleased that things between them hadn't changed. After all this time, Stephen was still interested in her, and Elsa hadn't distracted him. Hazel, Moira hissed, grabbing her hand. What is it? Hazel didn't want anything to destroy her good mood, and by the look on her sister's face something awful had happened. Did you hear what he said? Who? Stephen, of course. He said that Elsa was staying with the Miller family. Why do you think that she would be staying there? They've had other people stay with them. What are you thinking? What if Tom likes her? There's nothing you can do about that. Moira crossed her arms in front of her. Find out what you can about her for me? How? Ask Stephen when you see him again. Why has she come here when she changed her mind two years ago? I'm sure there's nothing to worry about, Hazel said. Well, that's okay for you to say since you've got Stephen now. I wouldn't say that, but anyway, why don't we go and visit the Millers? We'll say we've come to greet Elsa. She's most likely around our age, and that's what we should do anyway. Moira smiled and her shoulders relaxed. Yeah, let's do that. We'll welcome her into our community. Chapter 15 Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 On the way back from Mrs. Stutzman's house a few days later, Moira and Hazel decided to take the long way home past Mrs. Miller's house to visit Elsa. Hazel was a little concerned that Stephen hadn't been back to visit her recently, and something deep down inside her niggled at her that it had something to do with Elsa. When they were fairly close to the house, they saw that Tom Miller's buggy was heading toward them. Both stopped to say hello. 
Hello girls, what are you doing out this way? Tom Miller asked. Hazel was the first to speak. We've come out to meet Elsa. We've heard that she's around the same age as us, and we're going to welcome her, since the next gathering is a week and a half away. I thought she might like to meet some people sooner. She'll like that, I'm sure. I'd better be on my way, Tom said smiling at both girls. The girl said goodbye. Why didn't you speak to him? Hazel asked Moira once Tom was a distance away. I don't know what to say when he's around. I go to say something, and then I stop and think that he might think that I'm silly or something. What if I say something that he thinks is stupid? Hazel said, it won't matter. You won't say anything silly, but you have to talk or he won't know that you like him. Moira rubbed her forehead. He'd talk to me if he liked me, wouldn't he? Most men need encouragement, and anyway, how is he going to get to know you if you never say anything to him? Hazel asked. He might not like me, Moira said. Hazel breathed out heavily. She didn't have time for Moira's silliness right now, she was worried about Stephen not coming to see her. Just speak to him next time you see him or I'll pinch you. Hazel, you'll do no such thing or I'll tell mom. Just then they arrived at the Miller's house. Mrs. Miller stepped out onto the porch to greet them, followed by a girl dressed in black with no apron. That must be Elsa, Hazel whispered. Yeah, must be, but she's wearing funny clothes. I guess that's what they wear now. Now be quiet or they'll hear us. Hazel jumped down from the buggy and tied up the horse before they greeted the two women. Hazel saw that Elsa was rather ordinary in appearance. It was only when she smiled and her light brown eyes brightened that she could be considered attractive. It's lovely for you two girls to come and visit, Mrs. Miller said. I'm sure that Elsa will be pleased with some young women's company. Stephen Williams told us that Elsa was here and we thought we'd come and meet her, Hazel said. You know Stephen? Elsa asked, smiling. Hazel knows Stephen very well, Moira replied. Thinking that Moira sounded too aggressive, Hazel explained, it's only a small group here and everyone knows everyone else in the Amish community for miles around. Elsa nodded. Hazel felt sorry for Elsa. She was alone in a new country without her parents and without any friends. Do you sew? Hazel asked when they were sitting down with coffee. Yeah, I love to sew, Elsa said placing her cup back down on the saucer. You could come to Mrs. Stutzman's house with us whenever you want. We make quilts there. Moira and I go there nearly every day. Thank you, I'd love that. Where does Mrs. Stutzman live? Moira blurted out, it's a long way from here. Probably too far for you to go there every day. Mrs. Miller said, no, three days a week Tom goes right past the Stutzman's. He could take you there and then collect you of an evening. Wonderful, Hazel said, smiling at Elsa but aware of Moira glaring at her. What brings you out here to America, Elsa? Hazel asked. Both my parents died recently and I was alone. They wanted me to come out here some time ago, and I thought that I'd honor what they had wanted for me. That's nice, Hazel said. I mean not that your parents died, of course. It's good that you came here is what I meant. Thank you, Hazel. Everyone here has been so nice to me, Elsa said. The group of women organized between themselves that Elsa would go to Mrs. Stutzman's house the very next day. Hazel knew that as soon as they were out of earshot of the house, she would get an earful from Moira, and she was right. Do you realize what you just did, Hazel? Yeah, I have welcomed a lonely girl and I'm trying to make her feel at home in a strange country. Just as the Stutzmans made us feel at home. Wrong. You ruined things for me. Now Elsa will be hours and hours alone with Tom every week. They will be driving to the Stutzmans and back three days a week. I told you I like Tom. When Hazel remained silent, Moira asked, why are you trying to ruin things for me with Tom? Hazel swung her head to look at Moira. I'm not at all. You haven't even spoken two words to Tom. You've ruined things for yourself. Moira kicked the front of the buggy as she drove it. Now he'll fall in love with Elsa. People don't fall in love with someone just because they spend time with them. Then Miriam's words of weeks ago rang in her ears. Miriam had said to Hazel, that Elsa would be another woman to compete with for a husband. Hazel bit her lip. Moira didn't say anything, and stared straight between the ears of the horse in front of her. I'm going to take you home and then go to the store, Hazel announced. 
Moira glanced over at her. Why? We don't need anything. Hazel was irritated with Moira's bad mood and sorely inflamed over her own situation. It annoyed her that Stephen hadn't been to see her in days, not since the first time he'd come from the port. Moira didn't let up. You just want to see Stephen, don't you? Yeah, I do. I'm worried that he hasn't been around to see me, Hazel said. He's just busy, I'd say. He might have a lot of things to catch up on. Hazel pressed her lips together and pushed back some strands of hair into her prayer cap. Do you think so? Yeah, I know it would be true, Moira said. Hazel looked at her sister and Moira smiled at her. Moira wasn't so annoying to her anymore. Thank you, Moira. I feel a little better now. I won't go to the store, I'll wait until he comes to see me. That would be best, Moira said. Hazel poked Moira. Listen to you, like you're the big expert on men when you can't even talk to the boy that you like. Moira laughed. I guess that is funny. I'll speak to him next time I see him. Hopefully I'll think of something to say. When they got home, their father told them that things were going to be tough for a while. The crops this year weren't going to be as good as they'd planned for, because of the tornado that had swept through their land. What will we do, Dad? Will we have enough to eat? One of you, perhaps two of you, will have to marry. When both of the girls looked at him with wide eyes and open mouths, Mr. Shantz laughed. I'm not serious, he said when he'd finished laughing. The girls exchanged glances, failing to see the funny side. How bad are things, Dad? Hazel asked. Between the three farms, we'll make it through. We'll have to hope and pray that next season will be better. Hazel couldn't help feeling slightly annoyed. What had changed for them? Their lives were supposed to be better in the new country and so far, their lives weren't that different. They still had the same old struggles. You shouldn't worry the girls about things like that, Samuel, the girls heard their mother say when they walked out of the living room into the kitchen. Do you think things are really bad? Moira whispered to Hazel. It's my turn to go to Miriam's house to help out tomorrow, so I'll ask her. She's sure to know. Chapter 16 Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 Hazel, Moira, and their mother were still taking it in turns most days helping Miriam. Hazel got out of doing her own chores when she went there, but doing Miriam's chores made up for it. She preferred to help Miriam because the work was different, and then there was the baby to play with. Miriam was feeding the baby in the bedroom, and Hazel took her up a cup of coffee. There you go. Thank you, just sit it down there. Miriam pointed to the nightstand. Before Hazel had a chance to ask how bad things were on the farm, Miriam took the conversation in a different direction. What's happening with you and Stephen? Sadness welled up within Hazel. He came to see me as soon as he came back from the port, but since then, nothing. Miriam remained silent. At first I wondered if he liked Elsa now, and I went to see her, but I don't think that he likes her in that way. What's she like? She's very nice, and she's going to help us sew with Mrs. Stutzman some days. That's good. Hazel laughed. Moira doesn't think so because that means that Elsa will be spending time with Tom going to and from the Stutzman's house. It's hard being young sometimes, Miriam said. Yeah, I'd much rather be married and settled like you are. You know that Adam loves you for certain, and now you have James too. It is better, Miriam said, now with James upright against her shoulder. I'll hold him while you drink your coffee. Hazel put her arms out for James, and Miriam handed him to her. After Miriam had a mouthful of coffee, she said, you'll just have to be patient and see what God has got in store for you. Hazel said, I guess so. I don't like any other man, though. What about Evan? I guess I would have liked him if I hadn't met Stephen. Have you asked God which man would suit you best? No, I haven't. Is that what you did? Miriam set her cup back on the nightstand. Yeah. I pray about everything especially important things like that. Hazel gave a little laugh. I didn't even think that God would think that was an important thing. I thought crops and farming and having enough to eat would concern God, not who we marry. Who we marry is a very big decision. 
I don't know why you didn't include your heavenly father in a thing like that. Hazel shrugged her shoulders. Well, I can't do anything if someone doesn't want me as a wife. I'm not saying he will cause someone to like you, but he can show you different possibilities. Maybe someone new will come to town. What you're saying is that you don't think that Stephen Williams is suitable for me? Hazel patted James on his back while swaying in a rhythmical motion. You know what I think about him. I've made that no secret. I do think that you should pray and ask God what man would suit you best. God cares about every detail of our lives. It says in his word that even the hairs of our head are numbered. Hazel pushed out her lips and gave what Miriam said some thought. I guess you're right. Of course I am. Stephen is such fun though. These past months I've seen myself with no one but him. Put him out of your mind, that's my advice. Hazel decided not to talk to her sister anymore about Stephen. She did take Miriam's advice about praying. If Stephen were the man for her, then she'd end up married to him. Once she prayed that day while she helped Miriam with her chores, she didn't worry about who she would marry and left it in God's hands. Hazel hugged her sister as she said goodbye at the end of the day. Thank you for giving me some good advice, I feel better. Good I'm glad, Miriam said. Hazel led her horse out of Miriam's house paddock and hitched her buggy. On the way back to her house, she saw Stephen in his buggy heading toward her. He held up his hand. Stephen, what are you doing out this way? she asked when she pulled up next to him. Your parents told me you were at your sister's house. I was coming to see you. What is it? Is everything okay? Hazel wondered if there might be something wrong. Had one of her family been in an accident? He smiled. Don't look so worried, everything's okay. Do you have time to have a little walk with me? We can tie up our horses there. He pointed to a fence to the side of the road. Once they had their horses secured, Hazel walked next to Stephen and glanced up into his face. She wondered if he'd come to tell her that they weren't suited. That must be why he hadn't been to see her in days. What's wrong, Stephen? You look concerned about something. He put both hands lightly on her shoulders. Then he dropped one hand to pick up hers. Hazel Shantz, I've come to realize that I love you and I'm hoping that you feel the same. Hazel's eyes grew wide and she swallowed hard, not quite believing what she was hearing. He held her hand a little tighter and took a deep breath. Once he let out the air, he said, I want to know if you will marry me. She wondered if she'd heard correctly. You want to marry me? Yeah, I want to marry you. Will you marry me, Hazel? She soaked in every word that he said. He had asked her to marry him and there was no mistaking that. He wasn't just talking about it like he had in the past. There was no guessing what he really meant this time. She didn't have to think too long before she said, Yeah, Stephen, I will marry you. He scooped her into his arms. I'm so happy. I've been too scared to ask you. I have thought about how to ask you and... He released her slightly and then looked at her lips as if he were about to kiss her. Hazel had never been kissed and she wanted to wait for her wedding night. She cleared her throat. Should we tell our parents? He laughed and pulled her into his hard chest. We should tell everyone, but I guess our parents should know first. Even though this was exactly what Hazel had wanted, she was nervous about how everyone would react to her news. She was sure her parents would have preferred her to marry someone else. Miriam would not be pleased that Hazel had the man who Miriam had once loved. While still in his arms, Hazel realized that she was worried about what everyone else would think, and that was taking away from the happiness that she could be enjoying. Hazel knew that Stephen was a good man. He had changed in the two years she had known him. He was a good Christian man, he was a member of the Amish community, even if he hadn't been born into it. There was no reason why she should not be totally delighted that the man she loved loved her back and wanted to marry her. What will your mother say about us getting married? She's been trying to marry me off for years. She'll be delighted she likes you. Hazel raised her eyebrows. She does? Stephen laughed. Don't worry about what other people think about us, Hazel. We'll be the only ones in this marriage. How did you know that I was thinking of other people? I can read you very well. Everything you think is always written on your face. Hazel smiled. I was thinking what everyone would say. 
He put a finger under her chin and lifted her head so she was looking directly into her eyes. Hazel, do you love me and do you want to marry me? Her body relaxed. Yeah, I do love you and I want to be your wife. Good, then that's all we need to be concerned with. You know, in life you can't please everyone, and if you try you'll run yourself ragged. As long as your heart is right with God and your intentions are the very best, that's all you can do. Then you hold your head high and let others think what they will. Tears came to Hazel's eyes as Stephen's words struck a chord in her heart. She'd always been too concerned about what others thought and she realized that now. He stared into her eyes and she nodded. He wiped away her tears. She took a deep breath. Come let's tell my parents. Yeah, in a moment, then we'll go and tell my parents. He held her in his arms once more. I want to hold you like this forever. All tension left her body when she knew that this was the man for her, and she was no longer worried what people might think of that. Stephen Williams was the man God had chosen for her, and she was mighty happy about that. She closed her eyes and said a prayer of thanks that God had brought Stephen to her. She was going to be a bride at last, and better than that, she now had the man her heart had always wanted. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life. And have it to the full. John chapter 10 verse 10. Thank you for listening to Falling in Love. The next book in the Amish Bride series is book 3, Finding Love.